Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Corny Crows edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Today on the program, ZZ Top's influence on wrestling. I am once again pro wrestling's preeminent prognosticator. And are the dominoes starting to fall on AEW's fascination with garbage wrestling? All this and more. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you a man who only uses pizza cutters on his French toast, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. In fact, I had French toast just a short while ago. I can only imagine that you often have it directly fed into your veins by some type of tubal system. A tubal system. Of a system of tubes. Oh, no, that's ridiculous, but if that existed, I would certainly buy plenty of stock in the company that supplied the tubes. A tubal company. A tubal company. You know, speaking of tubals and, and tunnels, <laughs> I th- I've got, what are you laughing at me? Well, already, I'm, I'm about to talk about a disability I have here. I'm getting the carpal tunnel. Tubals and tunnels. I'm getting the carpal tunnel. You're getting it. I'm getting it. It has to be what it is because here, and I've got a new mouse, so now I have mice here, but not the kind that shit in the kitchen. Um, but I got a new mouse that's more ergonomically designed and I've moved my monitor set up on the deck because I noticed last week that where the mouse was sitting on the mouse pad here on my desk that I was leaving my, the bottom of my wrist, right where the palm of your hand joins the, 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 the palm bone connected to the arm bone. I'm leaving it laying on the desk and it's, and it feels like it's bruised. Well, then I've got the bad neck and this is my right hand and I got the bad shoulder and the bad neck is on the right side and the bad shoulders on the right side. All last week, I began getting an issue where every time I would turn my head in a certain direction, my, my, my hand would go to sleep and my fingers would tingle. And I've been trying to not getting those positions and it's getting better, but my wrist is still sore. I think that's the root of it. This technology is taking me apart piece by piece. It's destroying my whole right side. And that's my autograph signing side, not to mention check signing sides. I need this in good shape. Maybe you're signing too many checks. Maybe that's the problem. No, I'm, I'm fucking clicking around on this mouse. The mouse doesn't even have any fur. It doesn't have a cute little nose and whiskers. You don't have a wrist protector? What the f- Like a little thing? To use a goddamn computer? Oh, I need no, not, something, not a brace. A little thing you put on your desk, you put on your table, wherever you are, that you put you know, your hand on, your wrist on, while you're using the mouse. It elevates it a little bit. It's a cushion. It's very comfortable. I, I They come in all not- sorts of designs and different... This one I have here is some... You have one? Yeah, this is some kind of jelly here, but you can get ones that a, are not a jelly. A gelatinous substance? Of some sort. It's what you're talking about? It, of, I will say... Some, some, some ge- gelatinous housing of some housing? It was blue when it started. It's now green. But anyway, this is what I'm talking <laughs> that's, about. That's often been my experience whenever I've been out with you in various places. But I didn't know that there was such a product. You didn't know, As, you didn't know that? <laughs> no! I was not aware that they manufactured something like that. Have you ever been in like an office store? And, and I'm not saying they're good. I hate staples, but every now and then you have to go there. Well, no, you go to the office store, you get your, you get your copy paper, you get your writing pads, your pens, your scotch tape, things like that. I didn't, I've never, nobody has ever walked up to me and said, hey, put this under your wrist, see how it feels. When was the last time you were in one of these stores? Well, it's been, it's been a year and a half since I've been in a store. I know, and you just described basically what you would do if you were going in there as a teenager to get photos and like, send them to people. I need scotch tape, I need this. Well, you know, that was about a year and a half ago. Okay. I, I stocked up. Because of the COVID. How did we get the staples? Because you're telling me about this miracle new product that is not even a sponsor of our program, no. but hopefully somebody will be by the time we finish talking about it that I didn't know existed to help my my Corny's Tunnel Syndrome that I've got here. I mean, again, I don't think anyone has the patent on it. And I don't even know what it, exactly it's called because I just Googled wrist guards and it came up as a brace. It's like a thing you put on your desk. What The wrist... Uh... 
It can't just be something stupid like wrist protector. I'm the, gonna hurt the, my wrist if I keep doing this. The, the wrist, uh, the wrist Davenport, uh, the wrist Schiffer robe. The I don't wrist. know what term you're going for here. I've I've never heard of this product. A wrist rest. A sure. wrist rest. A wrist rest. <laughs> you need a wrist rest, my friend. Oh God damn it! I my wrist rest has been arrested by this rusty mouse that I had before and I was having to click it too hard and push it with with vehemence pushing the various clicking things with my finger and I think that's what's led to my tendon problems and my pain and agony and frustration at a what wrist point rest. at what point will a doctor be diagnosing this carpal tunnel no I'm not going to the goddamn doctor that's where the sick people go that's the last one. I haven't been to a doctor in a year and a half because I haven't been sick in a year and a half. One of those things it has something to do with the other. It could go either way. I don't want to go around the sick people just to get well. Ah, you've got now, see, you got me whimsical. I, you know, I was even going to talk about the the Trump suckers promoting the COVID by not getting vaccinated and all this other stuff, but I won't even get into that right now because it'll just put me in a bad mood. But I do have a couple of emails here. Would you like me to read these or do you care? Or are you just going to hang out while I do it anyway? No, you always have interesting emails to read and you have such a wonderful way of reading them. It's like a <laughs> narrator from the heavens listening to these you emails. Are, you are a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, you blew me worse than Ed McMahon would blow Johnny Carson on a fucking <laughs> Karnak. Nobody there. ruffles anyway. these emails the way you do because no one prints no. them out. Yeah, that's the other thing. Well, see, I got them right here in front of me <laughs> so I can read them right here at, at hand. Let's hear conveniently. them. If only we could hear them. Yes. Well, that would I'm about solve to, part of the problem. I'm about to read them to you. So, and this, and now see, now you've brought levity in this. And this was the first one's going to bring everybody way down. And I don't even mean to, but we have a, a an email from Travis. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to, uh, because he says, Jim and Brian to you two working from home since COVID began a year and a half ago has been rough, but hanging out with the dog while I ran my meetings and kept my teams moving forward really helped. I've found myself listening to the drive through podcast during downtime, and Leo, our dog, was usually on the couch in my office. I like to think he enjoyed what he was hearing as well. But my wife and I had to put Leo to sleep about a month ago, and listening to the podcast every week has been a comfort as well as being entertaining. I just wanted to take time to thank you both, and that's from Travis. And I wanted to recognize little Leo as being a fan of the show. And see, and you just ruined the sentimentality of that by getting us all just laughing horribly oh well, let me tell you hearing that that is very sad and i certainly send my uh, sympathies and you know i'm very sorry and the show will get better and well there you go um and norman writes from spartanburg south carolina by god by god spartanburg south carolina norman says i'm a 53 year old fan from spartanburg south carolina my cousin and I would walk the country back roads as kids with our paper grocery bags, picking up Coke and Pepsi bottles to take them back to the store and exchange them for 10 cents a bottle. This is how we got our money to go to the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium to see you and the Midnight Express. You guys were the greatest, and it was worth every barefooted mile that I walked collecting soda bottles to see you guys. Thank you, Norman. And now that's the kind of sentiment I like to know that people actually once walked barefoot down country roads in the middle of the summer to pick up pop bottles and change them or take them in for the deposit uh, to come and see us at the Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium. Should have kept the bottles and waited in the parking lot. Hey! Thrown I them at the express. Where were you your know, priorities, some Norman? Some of them did. Some of them did. I wonder if it was Norman. It was Norman. What do you think? Oh, wait a minute. Now, hold on now. He's 53. I'll be 60 this year. He's seven years. I'd miss 68. That means he was 17 years old when he oh, was. Oh, he had a good out. arm. He had a good arm. He could throw those bottles a mile. He was a 17-year-old pop bottle collector. Oh, thank you, Norman. We appreciate that. Um, 
And lastly, I'm not talking about you now. I'm talking about the last email here. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's from Eric. And, you know, this is in response that I've gotten a lot of them. And I'm going to read a few more of them over the next few weeks. I didn't want to just bombard everybody with them. But a lot of people felt strongly about this. And they've written in, and I haven't even read them all yet. I'm trying to sort through all these things. But, you know, a lot of people were offended since we have a number of listeners. And uh, most of them consider themselves to be smart people. Uh, a number of people were offended, naturally, by not only Uncle Dave Meltzer, but also Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang, saying that the people that listen to my show, our show here, Brian, you and me, both of us, they lambasted both of us on this. Uh, the people that listen to our show are stupid, is what the uh, the aforementioned Uncle Dave and Twinkle Toes said. Low IQ was used. Stupid was used. Um, several other terms were used. And our folks do not appreciate it. And Eric wrote on behalf of many of them. Hello, Jim and Brian. I've been a fan of Mr. Cornette for decades and decades, although I'm only 35 years old. See, I get them young, Brian, and I hook them. Uh, and I listen to the show religiously from front to back. It should be atheistically, but nevertheless. I would like to discuss the status of your low IQ listeners, as I've never emailed you before or even sent in a question. As you can tell, very little offends me. I mean, I am a fan of yours. However, the comments made by Twinkle Toes personally insulted me, and I felt I had to justify to you just exactly what and who your fan base actually consists of. I don't want to keep harping on this subject, but it's been a week, and I finally found the time to compose myself. I'm a high school algebra teacher with numerous degrees. I spent 10 years studying in Boston College, where I obtained a double master's degree in education and mathematics. In 2017, I was selected by the district to travel to Tanzania. And everybody knows all the top people in the field go to Tanzania. I was selected by the district to travel to Tran Tanzania, travel to Tanzania, which is right down the road from Transylvania. Remember when Taz was the Tanzaniac? He certainly was. To receive the Fields Medal is what Eric received. The Fields Medal is a prize awarded to two, three, or four mathematicians under 40 years of age at the International Congress of Mathematics, whatever. I, I crossed. Okay. Anyway, I pride two pages here. I pride myself on my intelligence. The comments that Twinkle Toes and Uncle Dave Meltzer made struck a nerve with me. I'm certainly not here to brag or blurt out my accomplishments. I just took it personally when they refer to your listeners as low IQ. I take pride in my job and bettering myself every day to be a teacher my students look up to, and it isn't a crime to be a fan of real professional wrestling and that of one Jim Cornette. He didn't specify which Jim Cornette, but that's from Eric. He took offense to being called an idiot. As I wonder... I wonder if anybody on that side of the fence is rethinking, slinging around dumb, stupid, low IQ or idiot comments after this week's happenings over there in the Lollipop Guild. We'll get to that later on. But I wonder if they're starting to maybe throw some of those uh, verbs around internally. Stupid. <coughs> dumb motherfucker. <coughs> stupid. Anyway. You know, Brian, I tell you what, it's awful. It's an awful lot easier to think, think clearly, evaluate the things that you that you do and that uh, that you might be getting yourself into before you do them. If you've had not only a good night's sleep, but also a healthy breakfast in the morning. Don't you think that's true? That's exactly right. And that's why that surveys have shown that 82% of the people who eat Magic Spoon in the morning for breakfast generally don't do stupid shit like some other people do that have a crummy, uh, sugar-filled breakfast like some of these children that play on the other channels. Folks, if you want a healthy breakfast that's good for you and tastes great but doesn't ruin your physical well-being, 
you go to Magic Spoon. It's not that sugar that has all the or sugar, that cereal that has all the sugar and the carbs and the unhealthy junk in it. No, it is the space age miracle of modern technology that now boasts zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving with 140 calories a serving. You can have two at that rate. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free, and you can build your own box or get the variety pack with flavors like cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, and cinnamon. This stuff tastes great. We eat it like trail mix around the house all day. And if you go to magicspoon.com slash gym and use the promo code gym at checkout, you'll save $5 off your order. It's got the 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, even a specious reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash gym and use the code Jim to save that $5. Abraham Lincoln will thank you. You know, it's been so long since I spent cash, Brian, since I haven't been out of the house in so long. I opened my wallet up the other day. Abe Lincoln didn't have a beard. Okay. Well, that Ed McMahon bit faded quickly. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, folks, a re real quick announcement. Uh, the... Uh, folks that have been waiting for the next batch of cameos to go on sale, wait no long. Well, wait a little longer because it's Sunday, August the 15th at noon Easter. We're going to do the same thing again. The end of the great American cameo bash started in July. It's going to end in August noon to 2 PM for two hours. All the cameos, your little heart's desires can uh, be found at cameo.com slash Jim Cornette Sunday, August 15th, noon to two o'clock. They will be on sale again. We're going to be shooting that batch uh, the following Wednesday, I believe, according to Hotchkiss's parole officer. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the cameos are the personalized video messages. I think we've established that by now, haven't we? I would think so. Because they go so quickly, and that's why we only do them uh, intermittently. Uh, but in, And also, I talked to Hotchkiss. The brand new JimCornette.com will be debuting Labor Day weekend. I'm going into labor and giving birth to the new JimCornette.com Labor Day weekend. Brand new site, brand new store, same old asshole in charge. But your shopping experiences and viewing experiences will be so much more easy, pleasurable. As Howard Finkel would say, good for you. That's all coming up on Labor Day weekend. And you know, Labor Day is the day when nobody works. Isn't it funny how that works out? It's nice. You, you never take a day off. You don't take Labor Day off. You're the only one working. Well, yeah, but I've been taking some time off lately and getting some stuff done. Been very happy with that. Well, time out. Huh, where are we going from here? I'll tell hopefully, you. So, hopefully up. Hopefully up. You know, we started we started high and then we've we've plateaued. Um we gotta make mention on the program here of uh Dusty Hill of ZZ Top passed away this past week. And I 72 years old, and that blew my mind. I'm like, he was 12 years older than me. They've always looked because of the beard gimmicks, right? They've always looked older. Than they actually were, and, you know, but I guess I don't know whether I thought they were 90-something or whatever, but you know what I'm saying. Appearances were deceiving. But they, okay, here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Music Man, has there ever been in rock and roll a band that lasted that long with the same lineup? I'm, well... With the same lineup. Yes, yeah, see, that's uh, they're in line. And when you say lasted that long, not they broke up in 1970 and had a comeback in 2015, and now. Well, it's I the don't same even lineup. know if there's anybody there. That, has there ever been a band from start to finish, even with a with a hiatus in the middle, that was the same lineup, no added people, no subtracted people, for that long? Fifty, what, fifty uh, two years or whatever? Well, it's certainly up there. 
That's because you're stumped, right? I'll well, take that as a no. There's I mean, because no I don't want to just start throwing out names. I mean, the Monks reunited in the 90s. Not that you'd be familiar with the Monks. Ooh, the what? Monks. The Monks. <laughs> they were five GIs that shaved their head like monks and formed a band while in Germany. When? In 1960, oof, 64, maybe? 63, 64? Okay, so they reunited in the 90s. That's still only 30 years. That's still They're only 30 peanuts. years. Peanuts. Bill Haley's Comets without oh. Bill Haley. Well, <laughs> well okay, yeah, that, 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 <laughs> I don't know. May, they may have it. They may have it. All right, anyway, um, Dusty Hill, ZZ Top, and, and not only did were they... He was a big wrestling fan. I think the other band members knew of it peripherally, but Dusty Hill was a big wrestling fan. We've talked about that sometimes in the past, but they also had the band and influence on the wrestling business. Not that they meant to necessarily, but they were a big part of the early MTV style, rock and roll style tag teams. Because their their not only their music lent itself, as we'll talk about some of the entrances, but also the music videos that they were doing for MTV because they had a budget and they read the cool car and the girls with the legs, right? And they were imitated. And now a lot of people think that the fabulous ones, which they did do the first ZZ Top videos, but the first fabulous ones video and music was Billy Squire, Everybody Wants You. And that's the way they were introduced, and they already got hot. And then they started doing the MTV-style ZZ Top videos with the car, and, you know, they didn't have the budget, but they, they had a car, and they got some legs, right? And But it was enough. And then where it started snowballing, and obviously we've talked about if there hadn't been fabulous ones, there wouldn't have been a Rock and Roll Express. Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson were still wrestlers already wrestlers, but they wouldn't have had the gimmick because the Fabs bred that gimmick for the secondary towns when Memphis was so successful. But Randy Hale, or Randy Hales, let me try this again. I love you, Randy Hales, but Randy West in Memphis, Randy Hales obviously was longtime announcer, promoter, etc. But Randy West, Jerry Jarrett's son-in-law, was the one that was editing the music videos at the time on Jarrett's editing equipment he had bought he had the cameras he had the the you know three quarter inch decks etc and Jarrett gave the inspiration for it and then he'd have randy go do his thing well when dundee became the booker in mid-south and brought everybody down from memphis uh something we haven't actually talked about i, I don't know whether we have you may have on your other programs brian was watts had Jarrett fly randy west down try to show Joel Watts how to edit the music videos, the rock and roll music video for the baby faces, right? The, you know, the rock and roll express jump and, and all the, and for a while and, and well, at, as, at the, as soon as uh, Dundee started and the Memphis crew got there, they started doing music videos. They slacked off maybe a little bit toward the end of the year, but they did a bunch of them earlier that year, but bless him. Joel couldn't quite get the, the lighting right on set, but they did. They tried to, for Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers, they recreated as the fantastics. They recreated the fabulous ones videos that Stan Lane and Steve Kern had done in Memphis, which were recreations of the ZZ top videos. But by the time that they got to the poor Bobby and Tommy in mid South and, and Joel was a, as I mentioned, a lighting genius. I remember one of them they did where they were just, they were in, top hats and trying to do the ZZ top thing like they were under a street light and you could barely see the antique car and some girl's foot right it was just it was <laughs> but you know anyway what? i'm glad to hear you say this because it's one of those things i would see and go is it the tape is no, it my no, tape did no, i get a bad no. dub I, what's going on I, it's nice to hear you say this it was no it looked that way <laughs> when they first put it in the show but it was poor joel watts trying to do his best but Anyway, um, but where that they obviously intersected with all this was that before in Memphis, you know, it was just some music videos in Memphis and, and the surrounding area, but 
now that the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton and Tommy Rogers, and they debuted with the ZZ Top music, and they debuted with the ZZ Top videos, and they're using Sharp Dressed Man as their entrance on television and all the house shows, and the Mid-South television show airs in Houston, Texas, which just happens to be the home of that little old band from Texas. And Dusty Hill's watching Houston wrestling every fucking Friday night, right? Or was it on Saturday night then? Regardless, whatever. Saturday night, Sunday morning. <clears throat> so <laughs> one night, and I, I've, I don't know if we, if Bobby Fulton, when he was on the show in the past, has told this story, maybe in one of his appearances, but one night they got the word. This was the summer of 84 when the Fantastics had come in at the Sam Houston Coliseum. Dusty Hills out at ringside. He, he wasn't at ringside. He was actually in ringside. He bought tickets and he was sitting on the fifth row, right, with his his wife, who was, as I recall, was a very short, tiny little woman. But anyway... Um, they want to see you or he wants to meet you and see the, uh, baby face and heel locker rooms, as we've said, were separate in the Coliseum. So I didn't know about this. We didn't know about it till afterwards. Bobby told us next time we were together, but dusty, they thought as soon as they heard, Oh my God, ZZ top is out there. Dusty Hill wants to talk to us. We're using his music and we're doing his videos. Here comes the hammer of justice, right? Whoever the Stephen P. knew of the day was is fixing to come down on. No, he loved him. He loved it. And he loved wrestling. And he asked him over to his house. And it was a fucking rib. I, I'm not saying like every single time they went to Houston, but there was a, a number of occasions that Dusty Hill would have the Fantastics over to his house either before or after the show in Houston because he just he liked wrestling and loved that they were, <clears throat> you know, doing that. And he, and he didn't stooge them to the record company. So one thing we had talked um, on one of the shows a while back about, you know, did any movie have more influence on wrestling than Road Warrior because of all the Lord Humonguses and the Road Warriors and you know, the Mad Maxes and et cetera, et cetera. But think about from the Fabs to the Fantastics and really with the Fantastics stuck with Sharp Dressed Man, the Fabs changed music a variety of times, but from that and all the other MTV style tag teams and people starting to spread all the promotions doing those music videos, there was a ZZ Top influence on wrestling for a, a couple of years there in the in the early 80s when MTV had come around. Um, but that, that fucking, that tickled me that, uh, that Dusty Hill, and that's the kind of guy he was. Cause I'll tell you some stories. Cause obviously my pictures with him in the midnight express book, but that's the kind of guy he would to be a big rock star like that. He just went and bought his fucking ticket and was sitting in the fifth row ringside and, you know, not trying to be a big big deal and, and back in those days especially in houston texas i guess he didn't need security but um i didn't get to meet him first until it, it when we had quit wcw at the end of 1990 and the fab i was managing the fabs actually back in memphis for the uh anglewood lawler in january of 91 Cat Collins, my friend that was working for Deaf American, it was Rick Rubin's record company. He's the one who introduced me to Rubin. He knew that we were going in and out of Memphis, and I talked to him. He said, hey, we're going to be the Crows, the Black Crows, who Rubin had just signed for his record company. He didn't produce them. Their producer, oh, what was his name? George Draculius, or a Greek name. <clears throat> but there was a little there was a little heat there because they did, apparently after they had their first hit record that he didn't produce but they were signed to his record company they didn't like their contract they signed anymore. But anyway, Crows are on Deaf American. They're going to do two nights in Memphis because they're opening for ZZ Top at the Mid South Coliseum. That was the Crows' first big tour, and after they'd had the first album, Shake Your Money Maker. So he said, are you going to be in town? I said, I can be because I was going to come in on Sunday anyway to make sure I was there for interviews and et cetera. So I, I figured I'll come in on Saturday and because uh, and, they're there for two nights, I'll, I'll see the concert on Sunday and then I'll be there for promos and Coliseum on Monday, blah, blah, blah. 
So he said, okay, I'll get you, I'll get you a room. Ruben's paying for it, but it's you. So he won't care. So I went over to Memphis that Saturday and met with the uh, cat. I think it was the Hyatt Regency downtown. If it's got a big atrium. And he said, well, he said, uh, no, I tell a lie. They had the show on Saturday night and I met cat at the hotel afterwards because they had got back before the show was over. And that's where we were going to the after party at the rendezvous. So anyway, they said, we're all going over to the rendezvous. So he takes me down. This is going to be a black crow story, but it's going to blend into a ZZ top story. Is that okay? Are we running low on time? No, this is uh, great. Keep going. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, he says, well, let's go down to the crow's room and they're going to take us over to the rendezvous on, on the bus. Okay. So I go in and he introduces me to these guys and, you know, is my friend Jim Cornette, blah, 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 shake everybody's hand, but he didn't say wrestling star or whatever. Well, I'm sitting over there. I'm not going to disrupt all these people that I've just met with their conversation, but I'm getting a ride over to the barbecue place. So they're talking to blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden the guitarist, what was his name? Um, Johnny Colt. He left the band after an album or two, but he was sitting there. He was looking at me. All of a sudden, he said, you're Jim Cornette, the wrestling guy. I said, yes. He's Now it comes to find out he's from North Carolina. So he's, oh, shit. But there's Chris Robinson who's sitting there who's notorious for not putting a lot of shit over. And he later on, he married Goldie Hawn's daughter. What was her name? God damn it. Kate Hudson. And then Kate they divorced. Hudson. <laughs> yes, but just that he married her just for a minute is good enough for me to get him over. With. But anyway, so Johnny Cole says to Chris Robinson, says, do you know who this is? And Robinson says, yeah, I know who he is. He's on TV. He's more famous than we are. I'm like, okay, so now that at least they know who I am. Anyway, that was a cool thing to say. But so we go to the rendezvous. So Kat has told me, yeah, we're going to do the show tomorrow night, but, you know, there's a little heat. Uh, with the 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 crows and and apparently, it I guess it's in the concert promoters contracts or whatever. Maybe this wasn't even something that came directly from ZZ Top, but the crows had completely separate locker rooms. The crows people were not supposed to converse or consort with the ZZ Top people, and vice versa. There was some kind of line of demarcation there, not not just the band, but also the staff people and whatever. And, you know, the the crows were kind of rolling their eyes about it. So we go to the rendezvous and we're sitting there. And, oh, they have the fantastic smoked sausage with that rendezvous dry rub seasoning on it. Oh, my God. And we're eating. But ZZ Top comes in because they obviously were on last, so they got finished later. And they go and sit down at the other end of the big downstairs you've never been to the rendezvous brian but they it's all down in a in a basement underneath this old building where they years ago were doing renovations and found these barbecue pits smoking pits and ovens and opened the place up <clears throat> so it's got all kinds of gimmicks and memorabilia all over it anyway so the zz top and their people's over at the other end of this room and we're over here and i'm eating my shit and all of a sudden a guy comes and taps me on the shoulder he says Excuse me, uh, Dusty wanted to know if you would come over and say hello. I said, oh, of course, because he had recognized me. I, I, you know, I guess from just watching wrestling. So I go over to the table and that's where, you know, hello, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. He said, did you go to the show? I said, no, I just got into town. I'm going to the show tomorrow. Do you need tickets? I said, no, my friend Katz fixed me up with everything. I, you know, thank you very much. And. When I said my friend Cat, he, he kind of, you know, shrugged it off. And, and I see Cat lingering behind me, right? And I'm, I, if I'd pointed, I'd give him the thumb. Yeah, my friend Cat. And, you know, so we're talking about wrestling. What are you doing here? Well, I'm going to be at the Coliseum on Monday. We're doing a wrestling show there, blah, 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 some small talk. And then uh, Dusty said, well, would you, would you like to? sit down with us. And I, you know, I felt bad. Cause I'm like, well, how I'm supposed to be with these other guys and they're riding me around on their bus. I said, well, I'm really, you know, they had invited me over here, but Oh, okay. Well just let us know if you need anything. Cause he's such a nice guy. Right. What I didn't know was when he went, turned around and went to sit back down and I started to walk back over cat had been waiting to see if I would introduce him to dusty Hill. 
Cause he told, I'm like, what the, wait a minute. You're the fucking in the record business. You're the goddamn music guy. You're here on this tour and you've never met Dusty Hill. You, I've just met him. I said, and you wanted me to introduce. He said, well, I've never met him. We were told to stay away from him. <laughs> God damn it. So the next day, besides if I got, that's when I got to go on the tour of grace. They set up a VIP tour of Graceland for the black crows. And we went on the bus and got to go through Graceland. Right. And they wouldn't let you take pictures with flash inside because it might, you know, fade the colors of Elvis's zebra print furniture or whatever. But there's a, one story real quick back to ZZ Ty. There's a long haul in, I think, down by the jungle room. There's a long hallway in Graceland where all of the gold records and the platinum records and the awards and the gram, but whatever the fuck that you can hang on a wall that is one in the music business that Elvis Presley won, it's hanging there, right? So we're getting a VIP tour. It's just our group, and and they know that this is a rock and roll band, right? But still, you know, it's fucking Graceland and it's Elvis. The one guy that's being a little bit of a pill is Chris Robinson. And the tour guide goes down the hall and points this and says, this was the gold record given to Elvis Presley for sales of one million copies of something or other. And Chris Robinson says, got one. And then they walk down and say, well, this is the platinum record. It was given to Elvis for sales of such and such and such and such. Chris Robinson says, got one. And then the tour guide points at this big rectangular plaque on the record on the wall and says, and this is the special award to given to Elvis Presley by RCA Records for sales of 100 million <laughs> records. <laughs> And everybody in the group, including his brother, Rich, turns and looks at fucking Chris Robinson at one, and he just, read him, read him. So anyway, then we go to the show that night, and I got to sit on the fucking, you know, equipment cases by the side of the stage and watch the Crows and watch ZZ Top, and then uh, went back. That's where I got the picture taken with uh, Frank Beard and dusty hill that's in the midnight express scrapbook because billy gibbons had had to leave early because somebody in his family was ailing or at, at some something or other so anyway at that point he said well, where i said well i'm still in in charlotte but i'm i'm working on something else and i you know uh, he gave me here here's my address so i gave him my address for two years two or three years after that I got Christmas cards from Dusty Hill just because he had my address. But the thing, I, it wasn't, he signed it like it's a scribble, right? It's not like he has a great legible signature, but it wasn't like he's sitting down, right, filling out all the envelopes and everything. I still have one of the envelopes because it's typed and it's obviously somebody in his office has done it. But the way he entered me in his book was the way that the Christmas card was addressed. Jim Cornette wrestling manager <laughs> like my my to the title of my job and in my home street address which at the time was one 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 two nine metacrest drive whatever um and then i guess he changed address books and i didn't get any cards for a year or two but then i saw him again in uh, johnson city tennessee at uh, they played freedom hall oh and by the way it wasn't a month later that the Crows got fired from that ZZ Top tour that made all the headlines because the sponsor of the tour was Miller Beer and fucking Chris Robinson went out and cut a fucking promo on Miller Beer basically tasting like cat piss and swamp water and got him fired off the fucking tour. And then they immediately went on their own because the album was getting big and they were pissed off that they were stuck underneath in an opening position, right? So there, there's intrigue in the music business too. Anyway, so then we go to John City. I hear they're coming to Freedom Hall. It, this was in 90, either 94 or 95 because we're running the building every month, right? And we, I see the advertisements. Well, I just, while I, we were there one month, I just got some tickets from that. We're renting their arena every month, 12 times a year. So they came up off of a couple of ZZ Top tickets and I knew the security people and the building manager so when we got there, I just, uh, you know, sent word back. Can you tell Dusty I'm here? I brought some things for him if he'd uh, like to uh, get together. And they took us around, did the, they had the radio meet and greet to do. Uh, and then afterwards, and then took us around to the other place with just five or six people. And I gave him some, 
Smoky Mountain DVDs. I figure every little bit, I, I dropped Ruben's name, but I felt like every little bit helps. Let's see if he gets excited. And I, he said he was going to watch him on the bus, and I'm pretty goddamn sure he did. So I, I haven't seen him since that point in time, but I, at least for a, a while there, I was comforting myself to know that he was watching Smoky Mountain Wrestling on his tour bus. But he was he was a big wrestling fan, didn't they? He did, uh, uh, I don't know if they were the guest hosts or whatever promotion they were doing at the time, but didn't they, they appeared on an episode of Raw, what, eight or ten years ago, oh, didn't they? it's got to be at least ten years ago. That was when they had like the Muppets host and Bob Barker and various people and ZZ Top, who yeah. were actually wrestling fans, or at least, you know. Well, yeah, Billy, I always heard Billy Gibbons was too, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, apparently the guy that had his hand up Miss Piggy's ass was a wrestling fan also, but I don't know if that counts for the Muppets. Now, I don't know. I never heard anything about Frank Oz being a wrestling fan. But I don't know. Hey, you know, you wait brother, a minute. What? Frank Oz. Yes. The wonderful Wizard of Oz. Frank Oz, a genius, was the man who had his hand up Miss Piggy's ass, as you put it. Ah. The voice of Miss Piggy. The voice of Cookie Monster and I Grover. That was, that was uh, uh, Milt Henson or Don Henson or Don Henley. What was his name? Ted Hanson. Ted Danson. Jim Henson? Dan Hanson. Jim Henson. Jim Henson. <laughs> you almost got there. I should have let you keep going. I should have let you. Just free association, <laughs> baby. Jim I'll get Henson. there. No, Jim Henson was the voice of Kermit. He had his hand up Kermit's ass. Oh. Frank Oz also, of course. Yoda. Well, he, was a, he was a noted frog fister. And Yoda. He, he fisted Yoda? And then he became a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see What About Bob with uh, Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfuss? I, actually, I don't think I did. That was Frank Oz's movie. Well. And you can go watch it with a whole different set of eyes now because you find out, no surprise, Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfuss hated each other behind the scenes. <laughs> so every scene there is legitimate tension between the two. But uh, I wanted to mention... Uh, and by the way, you know, very sad to hear about Dusty Hill. Eliminator is just such a iconic album. Yeah. Beyond wrestling, even. Just for that time period. It feels like that time period to me. It brings you back there. You know, so many good songs in an album. You said They, they were the hottest band in the land for, what, three or four years there. And you brought up the videos in Mid-South in 84. And the one that, unfortunately, follows me, and I hate it because, you know, not too long ago... I had a great revelation. I love music. I listen to all sorts of stuff from all different years. You love music? But I never... Any, any kind of music? You love music just as long as it's groovy? Yes, sir. But uh -huh. what I was going to say was I had never done a deep dive into the Jay Giles band. And I saw some footage of them in the 70s. I was like, holy shit. This is amazing. All I knew was Peter Wolf in the centerfold video. It looks like he's 45 years old and he's dancing around a high school. And then I see that old stuff. I'm like, it's but amazing. You, you, you never listened to 70s Jay Giles band? Until not too long ago. But I knew two songs. I knew Centerfold before that. And I knew Freeze Frame. And Freeze Frame is ruined for me. Because whenever I hear it, <laughs> I just think of Terry Taylor. All those different poses they had him doing for the fucking video. Freeze Frame. Oh, God. Yeah. And you know what? I I never got to watch Joel shoot any of those videos, but I swear to God, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall for that one. When there's Joel Watts with Joel was a he was a he was a nice guy, but he was as Jim Ross described Bob Cottle one time the epitome of a white kid. <laughs> Bob, he said about white man about Bob, but I'm trying to see Joel Watts was the epitome of just a a white meat kind of guy. With that big Adam's apple, trying to tell Terry Taylor how to strike those erotic poses for that video that all the women were going to flood the seats over. You know, you think about it, Mid-South in 84, maybe WWF later that year. But Mid-South in 84 did such an amazing job of incorporating all the music of that day in the show as it was happening. Van Halen Jump was the biggest song when it was on Mid-South Wrestling. You had ZZ Top, Eliminator, when it was still churning out hits. You had, what, PYT from, by Michael Jackson was on the show. I mean, JYD, the song was a little older, but in 84, Freeze Frame, 
A lot of those videos well, and, were all and P- P- within P- the last P- year that and a half. Was- that was that video of Coco wearing Norvell Austin and those Michael Jackson jackets and those red gloves. And all they were doing was dancing and drop kicking. <laughs> and that jump, good Lord, when when the Rock and Roll Express, you that was the summer of 84. They'd come in, I think, with probably their Memphis music, Rock and Roll is King. But the summer of 84, they used jump at the arenas, especially. And the people are just going crazy. And the crowds were so big for the rock and roll that sometimes they would fucking Watts or Jack Curtis, whoever was running the town, would pop 75 or 100 bucks for the guy to run the spotlight so they could do the big entrance, right? Because normally when, you know, fucking the, you know, average Mid-South 70s territories guys were walking to the ring, there was no music to begin with and all the lights were up and whatever. Now they're trying to do a rock and roll show because they got these big crowds in the Rock and Roll Express. So we're in Little Rock, Arkansas, a fucking big crowd, Barton Coliseum. And as you come out in the Barton Coliseum, you, you, you came out of the locker room area at the end of the arena. And imagine a big, it's a rodeo type arena uh where they have stock shows so it's a big long oval and they can have basketball and concerts and everything else but you come out of the end of it and they had a portable stage set up on the floor area behind ringside so you'd walk up the stairs to the stage you'd come out on the stage and everybody would see you and then you would walk to the front of the stage and down the stairs and down the middle of ringside point being rock and roll express big crowd the opening strains of Van Halen's jump hit the fucking PA system. The people are going crazy. The spotlight is playing all over the building, back and forth, revving up the anticipation. And suddenly it zeroes in on the back of the stage. And there come Ricky and Robert, and the place goes batshit. And the only lights on is that spotlight, and the Rock and Roll Express is in the spotlight. Well, Ricky and Robert, they can't, they're waving at the fucking people. And Robert doesn't realize that it's a T-shaped stage. And he walks diagonally over to the edge to wave at the people and dropped off the fucking stage. (laughs) He hit the corner where it veered into the T-shape. And we're standing in the ring watching this. And it's an awe-inspiring sight. And all of a sudden, he disappeared. It was just like he fucking... (laughs) Fucking... Trap door spot in the fucking movies, right? And then, and we go, oh my God, what the fuck? He's killed himself and his sellout crowd is, and and then you see a hand come up over the edge, the back edge of the stage, right? And he pulls himself up and gets to the, the spotlight was in their eyes. They couldn't see. Ah, jump. Jump. Hey, let me ask you, with the Rock and Roll Express and the various music, Rock and Roll is King is the one I was thinking of for them in Mid-South when they first got there, like you said. What did you think was the best music for them in terms of when they would come out and get that big reaction? What music do you hear in your head? Oh, God. Um, It's hard to erase the pop of the first notes of Rock and Roll is King that they would get, and that's when, you know, people first saw them and the girls shrieking and et cetera. Um, and for a, a while there, they use, uh, they switched to, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. Um, I remember that video on mid South. Yeah. And that, that worked, but it just, it just didn't seem like it brought the people up instantly like the rock and roll is King did. But then honestly, my favorite was in Smoky Mountain. They knew that they couldn't be teeny bopper, teeny boppers anymore. And they changed to old time rock and roll. And the people got with that. And we couldn't play the long version on TV with the big buildup, right? The big instrumental buildup, but we could in the arenas and we'd play that. And the fucking people would get clapping and clapping and clapping with it. So finally, Boom, when it kicked in with the, the where the radio version starts, here they come through the curtain, and that got a fucking pop. So, it just, but Rock, the first was probably the best. I noticed you left off Boogie Woogie Dance Hall, as well as Woo! the poison version of your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> you heard. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> 
closing thoughts on rock and roll and wrestling as we move along. Well, since rock and roll's dead and wrestling's dead, <laughs> I guess the segment is dead. The segment, and we will move on. And I, we're going to have a, a special segment a little bit later on, uh, Corny Crows, about things that I'm right. But actually, there were so many things this week, we didn't want to just overload that one segment with things that I've been right about. But apparently, there was a the WWE investors call, the conference call, where they tell everybody how they're doing and pep all the stockholders up on the unlimited future that the company has and etc uh revealed a little bit this week about what vince mcmahon thinks about aew and situation possibly with some of his talent going to work for him and brian it sounded remarkably similar to something that i have been saying or said several weeks ago and have said on a couple of different occasions did it did it to you it sounded like what he was saying publicly is like what you said he was probably thinking, yes. Well, what he said what he said publicly was that AEW is not competitive. They don't consider them competition, which he said that about everybody except for WCW in the late 90s, which was competition. But he said that about so that's nothing groundbreaking, but I liked the the closing comment when the guy had asked well, AEW is investing heavily in talent, and uh, should you be doing that? Or uh, I forget how exactly how it was phrased, but should you be investing heavily in talent also? Or uh, or you know, do you think that that's something you should be doing? Should you be running with what you've got or whatever? And Vince came out and basically said, and you could kind of tell he was rolling his. I can detect even with Vince's voice being older and not as quite as commanding as it used to i can still tell when he's getting his eye rolling expression verbally he was talking about them investing heavily in talent he said maybe we can help him out with that a little bit i'm not surprised he says they're not competition because let's face it in the global scheme of things they're not competition they're an annoyance on television but it's not like a fight for existence like uh wcw under turner and 98 or 90 97 or 98 was but he wouldn't have said that if he wasn't happy that they're going out and breaking the bank for everybody they can sign especially if he's done with them now that yes i understand people well he always says nobody else's competition usually because it's true but how did that strike you and he's well we can help them with their talent investments I mean, in a sense, it struck me the way you're saying it, but in another sense, it struck me as trying to publicly say that AEW is no threat whatsoever. I've been very vocal about my problems with AEW's booking and various issues, but as a business, they've got a lot of momentum. Look at the ticket sales just the last few days. There's a lot going on for Vince to just completely dismiss them like that and then say what he said about talent I don't know. I mean, the other thing you got to remember is it's one thing if your strategy is I'm going to dump all my talent on this person and they're going to invest so much money in them, they're not going to be able to do anything. That doesn't work when it's a kid with no board of directors who has unlimited capital. If his dad's attitude is really, I'm going to give you your inheritance now or a portion of it and just go have fun and do what you're doing. And beyond the video game division, he is making a profit. I mean, he's doing something right with that. So I think. I think Vince's strategy at AEW has been wrong the whole time, maybe. But I understand why publicly he would try to completely dismiss them at a time where they're right now. I mean, they've never had more momentum than they have right now, pizza incident or not. <laughs> and which we'll, we'll cover later on with our uh, Domino's Pizza-sponsored review of AEW. Uh, but well, now you say his, his way of, of dealing with them has been wrong all along. Does that mean that he should not then have originally given guys more money to probably than he ever would have given them to stay? Does that count in being wrong also until he saw what he was dealing with and then said, well, we'll probably stop doing that? Well, look at the guys that were offered that big money to stay. Would any of them have hurt WWE to leave? Would any of them have greatly helped AEW when AEW was first starting? And now that we know how 
what would happen to AEW several months after a TV show would start due to the pandemic and how everything really changed. Who? Gallows and Anderson? They ended up there anyway. If they were really offered all that money back then and Tony Khan got them for less now, he got a better deal out of the whole thing. But Vince, the money they were offering them to keep them like they were a game changer was ridiculous. It really was. And but they were offering everybody everyone. Money to stay I'm using them as an example. And I think yeah. it was stupid. I mean, I think it's one thing if it is a Brian Danielson or a Daniel Bryan, I think it's one thing if it is a Cena, Randy Orton, who ended up resigning for five years, I believe I, I could be wrong. That's one thing. But when they were offering all this money to these guys that are not difference makers, that's when it was like, what are you doing? Well, that's why they quit doing it. Yeah, well, they quit doing it when they realized it didn't make a difference, and they also blew it with NXT against them. Either don't run against them or go full bore against them. They got they were wishy washy. Yeah, they they should have brought more uh, talent from the other two shows across to get some of those guys established in the people's eyes, and they didn't do that. They just let the the C team do their thing, which which actually. Does that show something that the C team with only a couple of stars being brought back, Finn Balor, uh, just doing their thing without hot shotting, come within a couple hundred thousand viewers of the other program doing everything they possibly can? Um, maybe that that's what they wanted to see. I don't know. We shall find out. We shall but find I, it, out. It, it, it appears that Vince is willing to send some more people over to Tony, especially if he's finished with him. Hey, if that's Vince's attitude with a big show or a Mark Henry or even a Christian, I can understand it. If that's his attitude with an Aleister Black, then his attitude's wrong. You know, that that guy... Um, and I'm using may, him as an example for other guys. Well, like yes. He, yeah. But he may actually, he may get over until they do something stupid with him. He uh he seems to have the intensity and he's a he's a very weird looking chap. And he was there for a long time and he had a great look and he did some cool things in the ring. And for whatever reason with me, it didn't connect. And I think a lot of it was the way he was used. We haven't even seen him work a match yet. I'm more interested in him now than I've ever been in him in him before. But I mean, there's an example. Vince gave up this talent. They picked him up. You know, FTR. Time will tell in the long run what that move was, but I don't that, know. I, I, that, I, that move was to hide the people that embarrass the young bucks and show them, show the world that they don't know what they're doing. That, that's the only thing that could have been. I mean, what, be, just, you know, again, bring them in, have the match. Boom. We're done. No rematches, no program, no series between the two greatest teams in the world. Just let's get that win. And then you guys, you can wrestle on TV in another few months. And again, to my philosophy that Tony doesn't have anything to worry about in terms of budget. If it's a game of chicken to see who's going to raise the salaries of wrestlers, Tony does have the capabilities to just say, I'll hire whoever. And then Vince is going to have to deal with that. I mean, it is a dangerous game of chicken if Vince wants to say that, oh, you know, they could have whatever talent. It doesn't matter. Vince can't create stars like he used to. Well, but do you think that he's got everybody that he gives a shit about locked up for the next couple of years long enough that he thinks, well, this whole thing has got to blow up sooner or later? Well, we haven't heard about a five-year deal. I'm not saying it haven't been signed recently. We haven't heard about a renewal that I could think of in the last several months. Randy Orton was, what, two years ago, so he would still have three years left on his contract other guys probably in that range if they re-signed at that point in time it will all be very interesting how it all plays out but you know if you want to criticize AEW and their talent that's one thing but when you're Vince McMahon doing it and I've seen your TV in the last couple of years <laughs> he ain't doing himself any favors is he yeah you're not exactly a wizard anymore buddy pay no attention to the man behind the curtain um well, on a related subject of people behind curtains and people that should be behind curtains or just have things thrown over their faces, I had, a, I had an email that I can't find, but I'll paraphrase it because <laughs> it was a simple question. I went saw Mike Leno do that live. He goes, I, I recorded an interview with Dick Steinborn. Oh, it won't play. I'll just tell the story. <laughs> well, this this boiled down to a fairly simple question. Um. The emailer said that he had heard that uh, Jeff Jarrett talking about, 
our friend Shitstain, Mr. Russo, saying that he did not understand how to talk to wrestlers. When what did I have to say about this, basically? And yes, this is not to hop on the aforementioned skid mark specifically, but this is, I've, I've referenced this sometimes, just the people, and this was the way it was in the late 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Now, the people in the business talk like civilians that have never been in the wrestling business um, and use the words and the phrases and the things that used to drive everybody in the wrestling business crazy. So this may not be so, so applicable these days because the biggest marks are in the business already. But in those days, especially at Vince's national expansion, when more backstage or, or peripheral people started uh, getting involved in the business and able to converse with the guys, which before that didn't happen because nobody outside the business was smart or was allowed to speak to you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when they started getting writers and producers and uh, people of that nature around the, and the, the TBS executives, or then later on the WWF, when they started hiring executives, there's always been a divide between wrestlers or people in the wrestling business and those outside it because the people in it were living it. They understood it to varying degrees. They knew what was going on, and they also knew how to speak about it and not come off as condescending or insulting or clueless or ignorant of what the deal or any of those things. And people outside the wrestling business didn't because they didn't live it. They didn't take it seriously. It wasn't their fucking life. It wasn't, they were, weren't traveling two and 3000 miles a week and working seven nights a week. And whether they getting either, they weren't either rock stars where they were being, uh, you know, fawned over and adulation of the fans, or they weren't the heels where they were having batteries and rocks thrown at them and people trying to cut them. They weren't in the locker rooms. They didn't understand the philosophy of working and of uh, the brotherhood of rest. It was just, it was a show to them. It was a, a thing to them that people did as a, as a show and as an entertainment. And that's the way that, that not only people feel now, but that people in the business feel about it that way. Now they think they're actors playing a part or they're entertainers or whatever, but this was in those days it, until what, 10, 15 years ago, probably 20, uh, early on with some people, <clears throat> it was a completely different story. And the people in the wrestling business and the people outside the wrestling business couldn't communicate with each other. And, and a lot of it came about because, the guys in the business wanted to kayfabe and, and, and they weren't even, obviously they weren't happy when a lot of these people got smart. TBS just smartened everybody up. Executives would come in at random and, and see things just because they were walking through, you know, the building or whatever. And there was no thought to kayfabe in anybody that worked for TBS. And most of the boys didn't like that because there's more people. They're going to go home and tell their kids and blah, blah, blah. But also, it was the way that things that things became to be pitched. Now, if the writers come to any of the talent and tell them this is your gimmick and this is what you're going to to say and this is what you're going to do and this is how you're going to dress, they're just nodding up and down. They're like, oh, okay, because this is the only place they're working and they're going to have to do what they're told, whether they like it or not, or they'll get fired or just not used. That was a foreign concept to anybody in the wrestling business because you already decided what your name was. You decided what your gimmick was. And you decided how you were going to fucking do it. And because based on what kind of promo you did cut and what kind of match you did have. Now, if a promoter that was a big success, a Bill Watts, or if, if if Sugar Bear Harris is unemployed and Jerry Jarrett wants to book him as Kamala the Ugandan Giant, hey, he'll listen to that idea because it's going to make him some money. Um, if a genius booker says, I want you to come in, I'm going to feature you on top, I'm going to 
give you a push, put the title on you, guarantee you X amount of dollars a week minimum, whatever. If you do this gimmick or this name, or I want you to be the brother of this guy, then you have the opportunity to say yay or nay. If you go with it, then you go with it. Sometimes people had buyer's remorse on changing their gimmick or adopting a brother or whatever. Sometimes it worked out that was made their careers, but you had the choice. And a lot of times uh, people, and I'm not just saying about shit stain or about some of the modern writers, Kevin Dunn was one. They didn't understand that you weren't just telling an actor to switch a part, or you weren't just telling a guy to switch a gimmick. You were asking a guy to change his career around. And even in those days, this was before developmental where they got a hold of them from scratch. So in the nineties, Guys already had an idea of who they wanted to be. Obviously, it all got changed with T.L. Hopper. Tony Anthony never wanted to be T.L. Hopper, but he wanted to see if he could make WWF money. Uh, but it used to be a collaboration amongst the talent involved, single or tag team, and the booker or the booker slash promoter if it was both guys. And then all of a sudden, remember the... The survey they did amongst some of the TBS ex uh, executives and employees and people in the office on what they felt, and this was in, what, 1990 under Heard, they f what they felt about the talent and how they thought they should be presented. And everybody was on board with Sting and Luger because they looked like, you know, a million dollars physically, and everybody, Ric Flair, the Nature Boy, woo, Ted Turner likes him. But then they were actually giving random suggestions that would be fed to Jim Hurd on what to do with the rest of the roster. And I'll never forget this one. Because they were saying, what are the strong upsides and or any strong downsides to these performers, as they called them? And the, some of the feedback that Hurd got that he read in the goddamn meeting was that Eddie Gilbert and Kevin Sullivan as wrestlers, had no strong downsides, but no real upsides either. So perhaps they could be paired as a tag team called Gilbert and Sullivan. What? <laughs> and I know for a fact, if it had been on, Kevin's not really that kind of guy, but I bet you Eddie Gilbert would have knocked whoever wrote that out if he could get him on the street alone. Um, But th that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example, and that's why Russo was polarizing, because for people who took the business and themselves seriously and their careers seriously, his just willy-nilly telling them to do just goofy things, the younger people, the less established people, the lower on the totem pole people, were like, yes, you know, fucking feed me Elmer's glue and I'll thank you for the ice cream. I want to be on TV, Any, anything that I can do to get on TV. But the more established people that knew what the fuck were going on, like, what the fuck? I'm not going to do all this stupid shit. It makes me look like an idiot. Um, And like I said, it wasn't uh, uh, just limited to shit stain. Kevin Dunn, here's a, here's a Kevin Dunn story that I've never told before, I bet you. <clears throat> but this didn't even involve me and him. I, it was, it, we were not together. But it was still another way that he viewed the talent and I viewed him. Um, at the end of 96, they decided to take me off, off as a man, off television as a manager, because I think we've mentioned this. I was never on the road. When I started with the WWF, it was because they wanted a spokesperson for Yokozuna for TV and pay-per-view, but Fuji was already his manager so he could make the house shows. Um, I was still running Smoky Mountain Wrestling. So all I made from 93 through the end of 95 were TVs and pay-per-views. And uh, the, I th the one house show that we were booked on was that Madison Square Garden show. Got, we got snowed out in Knoxville, me and the Heavenly Bodies. But then when I moved to Connecticut and took the job in the office, now I'm on the creative team and I'm a whatever they called them back then, whether it was an agent for the matches at TV, they call them producer now, TV match agent producer. I was doing that at the TVs and pay-per-views. I was also still managing on camera. Now it was Bulldog and Owen and Vader, etc. But I still didn't go on the road to the house shows. 
Every couple of a couple of times when I had the thing going with Jose, they took me to the forum in Los Angeles or whatever, but I was not on the road. So at the end of 96, they said, well, let's, uh, let's take you off the road as a manager because you're here in Connecticut. You got to be at Vince's every Wednesday. So we'll just eliminate managing and you can transition to announcing because I had already been um, doing the uh, syndicated TV WWF superstars with Jim Ross. And I said, what was it? International heat. That was a said, we voiced those over in Stamford at the studio. So anyway, so I undertaker tombstones me. They put me in the body bag. I'm not a manager on television anymore, but I'm still doing the, agenting the producing the creative team and the peripheral stuff and the announcing but i guess i gotta explain to everybody my mindset at the time was and brian you know this i'm there in the wwf at that point and i'm living in connecticut at that point because i need to make some money and that's the the preferable job available at that point in time in the wrestling business because i'm not going to deal with atlanta again but I never dreamed, hoped, imagined, I only feared that I would be working in the WWF office in living in Connecticut for 10 years. Because I was mortified. Bruce had been there for 10 years. He'd bought a house. I'm like, fuck. I knew that something was going to happen, whether I cracked or something else came along or whatever the case. I was looking at this as I'm going to be here as long as I can, as long as I can take it. But this is not where I'm going to be for the rest of my life because I can't live here that long, right? So I'm doing the announcement, which, by the way, all this came under my one one price fits all. I never asked for more money. I never had separate contracts. You know, you get an announcing contract. You got an agenting contract, whatever the fuck. They say, hey, we want you to... I'd been filling in on announcing since, since really shortly after I first got there. Remember when, when Savage quit... I filled in on Raw for a couple of weeks with Vince until he, they could. I think that's when Lawler had also. I've, I every time somebody quit, I filled in on Raw. Right, Lawler the first time, fucking Savage, whatever. So a lot of times they just say, "Hey, we want you and Jr. to start doing superstars. Come down to the to the studio on Thursday mornings at ten o'clock. Do the voiceovers. Okay, whatever." But I had at that point certainly not decided without knowing how long I was going to live up there, how long I was going to work for the WWF and what else I was going to do in the wrestling business going forward. I had not decided that I was going to retire for good from managing or do anything uh, of any major change in my career until I saw what the fuck was going on. Right. That's understandable. So one day, Jennifer Good, one of our producers who I, I love to work with her. She was great. She was on the ball, had all of our notes ready to go and the formats and everything was an ace producer. I'd already had issues with Kevin Dunn over the, just the whole way. As I told Jim Ross one time, I said, he talks to me like I'm the guy that ran the Ferris wheel at the County fair with all of his sports entertainment horse shit. And this ain't wrestling. And I, I was vibrating since first time I ever had to have a meeting with Kevin Dunn and Jr. knew that. But anyway, so Jennifer Good comes in one day with a box and says, Kevin sent you something. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I opened the box. Do you remember when they got the, they did the WWF slash logo for the Attitude Era? Yeah. Okay. And they got the announcers like Jim Ross and Michael Cole. They got them the monogrammed shirts, right, to wear on TV. Right. Well, he had given me a box, and there's three of these nice monogram shirts, a white one, a red one, and a black one. And I said, well, that was, that was nice. I, you know, I was, actually, for a second, I was like, well, Kevin Dunn gave me something for free. Kevin Dunn actually thought about me. Holy shit, maybe I've misjudged the little weasel-faced cretin. And so I said, well, Jennifer, tell him I said thank you. That's nice. And she looked, and she's like, well, he wants you to wear them on, on television. And I said, well, I said, I don't think under my jacket will they be able to see the logo. She said, no, he wants you to wear these, not your gimmick. Or she said, not your suit or what. In other words, he wanted me to start dressing like Michael Cole and Jim Ross and Kevin Kelly 
and the other announce the play-by-play guys, the straight guys, instead of the manager slash color commentator slash gimmick that Jim Cornette has been with the Marilyn Monroe tie or the colorful jacket or whatever the fuck. And so she said, no, he wants you to wear them on TV. So that when I saw, I said, okay. I said, in that case, I said, you tell him that I said, when Lawler stops wearing his King gimmick, Cornette stops wearing his and I'll drop the racket and everything until then. Thanks for nothing. And I still have those shirts, actually. They're in the they're in the vault. I went through my closet last year and cleaned things out and put them in the vault. But they're there. I did end up wearing them a number of times with my suit jacket on because I especially like the color of the red one. But see, here's the thing. That could have been avoided because it wasn't Kevin Dunn's place. See, that's the thing. The the the, the TV that was our whole issue to begin with. The TV department over there had control over the wrestling instead of the wrestling having control over the TV department, which never made any sense to me because the product is what we are televising. We're not shooting a TV program about the TV crew. So Kevin Dunn making decisions on how the ring sounded versus what it felt like for the fucking guys to bump in it or just willy-nilly telling people to drop their gimmicks when he didn't have a goddamn thing to do with uh, with talent. That's where... You know, that's the situation. If Vince McMahon had ever come to me for five minutes, he didn't even have to use his Jedi mind tricks. He could have said, hey, Corny, since you're not managing right now, we want you to be more straight on on the announcing program. We want you to be the opinionated heel but blend in a little bit more. So wear suits because I wasn't going to wear a WWF button down shirt with no tie and no jacket anyway because i'd be sitting there looking like a fat frump especially at my weight then i was always going to wear a tie and always going to wear a jacket if i was on fucking television so he could have said we want you to wear the you know matching suits and primo stuff and you're more an analyst now and i would say yes sir and gone out and got some stuff just like i did less than two years later when I became the play-by-play guy for OVW television and was the straight announcer because I knew that's what my next long-term career move would be. But for a shit stain to go up and tell somebody you were changing your gimmick and you're going to be this or that, no, fuck you. I don't want to be this or that. I don't know how to be this or that. You just act like these are things that you ought to be able to change without notice because they treat people like actors or talent in a TV show instead of they're being themselves. And at that point in time, I wasn't ready to change myself because I didn't know what the next thing I was going to do yet that I wanted to do. And once I figured it, if you'll notice, the change came about pretty much when I had figured out I'm going to Louisville. This is going to be a developmental program. It's going to fucking work. I'm going to host the TV show. And I started buying new clothes and going on a diet. And that was toward the end of 1998, first part of 99. Then I had something I wanted to fucking change the old Jim Cornette for the new Jim Cornette. But before that, no. And that's that's one thing. It I did everything but one thing in the WWF, and it was related to television. I did. I was on the creative team. I was a manager. I actually wrestled. Not well, but I did. I did color commentary. I was a match agent and a TV producer. I did the training and talent scout. I booked the TV extras. I worked with the third party promoters. I produced location shoots. You know what the one thing was? I never, I only did it once and I never, never did it again. The event center. Do you, do you remember the event center? Of course. For those younger folks out there, when WWF still had syndicated TV on your local station, like God intended for wrestling to be, presented they had the local promos of the card that was coming to your town if one was uh in two different spots in the program and they were called the event center and they'd have one of their that was a todd pettingill thing he did them for years or there were other straight laced announcers that would do them and then i don't remember whether this is when michael hayes had become doc hendrick's whether it was right before he did that, but you remember the period of time where Doc Hendricks was doing the event centers. 
an embarrassing version of the event center. Yes, it used to be Sean Mooney in the production truck. Sean Mooney, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, but do you, okay, do you remember when they had Doc Hendricks walking down the spiral staircase? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in years. Yes. Okay, well, there's that there, room. There's, I remember that room. Yeah, it wasn't a room. It was a back. It was a large backdrop set, but it was in the studio, and it wasn't an enclosed room. It was just. It looked like a room, of one and a half walls where they had portraits of the WWF talent on it and logos and things. And there was a kind of a, not a spiral staircase, like in a goddamn submarine, but a winding staircase that went up to nothing. It was just about 10 or 12 feet tall. And it went up to a platform in the studio. This is you know, in the goddamn uh, underneath the, the television lights. And they would have the fucking announcer walk down that staircase while he's greeting you and welcome to WWF superstars or what and telling the big event coming to the Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky will be on Thursday, July 24th at 8 p.m. And get the card, all the information and pitch into the promos. But for whatever reason, either one had to be redone. If, if Hayes had started doing it, he was out of town or whoever the other guy, Pettingill was not there. I don't know who the fuck was to I needed to do an event center that need to be redone and shot, whatever. So I come down to the studio, put the fucking suit on, and, and I've done many local promos as a talent. At that point, I had never hosted a local promo. I wouldn't do that until I went to OVW in 99, but, you know, it's it's speaking and selling, so it's that's not that big of an issue, right? But they get me in there and they say, okay, start up at the top on the step there. And as you're coming, I'm like, what? Yeah, and you're walking down. I'm like, okay. Well, now I'm up at the top of this fucking phony staircase that goes nowhere. The TV lights are on. I'm supposed to walk down this thing in the shot while I'm talking and looking at the camera and being pleasant. And I'm like, fuck my knees. I have to, I have not for 35 years looked not looked at the stairs that i am on to make sure that i my knees don't like rubber bands snap and i fall and kill myself and so i'm trying to reach out and hold on to the goddamn fake banister to make sure i've got a grip on something and i'm trying to talk and walk downstairs and look pleasant at the same time and i find it took i don't know how long to do that one i said why am i walking down these goddamn stairs why can't i just stand here I, it's it's the same information. Or they think I just I woke up from a, a nap in the bedroom. I'm coming down. Oh, I didn't know you were here. Like it's a goddamn, you know, the fucking uh, uh, Ozzy and Harriet. Hello, friends. And so I never wanted to do that again. And I told him, I said, after this, I said, don't ever, ever ask me not that because it was rotten i'm sure they didn't want me to do anymore but i said don't ever ask me to do these again why am i walking down these goddamn stairs well more importantly and i never thought about this before by that point in time i stopped watching as much of the local syndicated shows as i had earlier did michael hayes begin every single segment by walking down the stairs i don't know and if so are we supposed to believe in the world of kayfabe that he's just walking down some hallway upstairs and he just, as soon as he walks in the room, they start the cameras and he walks down the stairs <laughs> to sell a bunch of crap. Hey, that's the same place they had uh, Paul Ian for his tryout that time that they made him fucking, what was it? They made him jerk on his ponytail and quack like a duck or what was it? You've heard that story. I've heard they do that kind of thing with everyone. I don't remember what the specifics were with Paul. Oh, God, no. I think JR told me that one time, I think, as we were doing voiceovers. What, oh, you should have seen what they did to Paul Lee. He had the ponytail at the time. They were they gave him some kind of gimmick to do promos for his try. This was his first tryout, which I think maybe what drove him to the extreme in ECW. But they had him pulling on his ponytail and, and making some type of animal noise or something. I don't know. I can't remember at this point. It's been 25 years. That's why Paul still works there. He's afraid that video will get out. <laughs> you know, they've got that somewhere. Yeah, they got everything. Boy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I should have asked. You know, I never even thought of it. While I worked there and was in the good graces, I should ask, hey, somebody show me that. Oh, anyway, you know, uh, 
You know, I have no segue, so I'll get right to the point. Folks, if you love furniture, have I got news for you? Uh, our, You know, we've talked about our friends at Helix Sleep. They do the great mattresses. We're obsessed with them. They give you the, a great night's sleep. They're, they're tailor-made and custom to people, and they, we just love them. But have you heard the big news, Brian? Well, you heard it because we talked about it on the show last week. Helix has now started making sofas. They just launched a new company called Allform, A-L-L-F-O-R-M, Allform, and they're making the best sodas, sodas or sofas in the game. Sofas, they don't make sodas they're yet. They're making sofas, for the record. They're Wonderful sofas. sofas. What makes an Allform sofa really cool? Especially cold weather, but... Here's the thing, for starters, you can customize your sofa using premium materials at a fraction of the cost of the traditional stores. You can pick your fabric. It's spill, stain, and scratch resistant. The sofa color, the color of the legs, the size, the shape. You can make sure it's perfect for you and your available space. They got armchairs and love seats all the way up to an eight-seat sectional. So there's something for everybody. And these bad boys fit together so you can start small and if you get a bigger place you move or you have more people coming over you can buy more seats later on and add on to the sofa to grow and change with the times and they're delivered directly to your home fast free shipping if you order most if you let's say you just go to couch central and you order a couch it takes months to get there and you need somebody to drag it in there or put it together or whatever all form takes a couple of weeks. It comes in the mail. It assembles by yourself in a few minutes with no tools needed. Just click, click, and you're done. It's amazing. Anyway, it's big. It's roomy. Setting up is easy. The whole nine yards, whether you get the sofas or the chair, and you don't need to worry about getting a sofa without trying it out first because you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's that's almost three months, 100 days, right? No, it is past three months. Well, that's just ridiculous then. I don't know why they do this. How do they make any money? That's because the sofas are great. Anyway, if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and they'll give you a full refund. And they offer exclusive discounts for teachers, students, military, and first responders. They offer financing and flexible pl payment plans. Their payment plans are more flexible than a contortionist in a sideshow. And they offer a forever warranty, literally forever, till the end of time, till the crack of doom. That's how, that's how long. With lots of soda. Lots of soda. Go to all form. I spelled it before. I, I shall do so again. A-L-L-F-O-R-M. Allform.com slash J-C-E. You're going to get 20% off of all orders for our listeners. Allform.com slash JCE. 20% off a couch now, for heaven's sake. How much more money can we save people? Well, folks, and now it is time for a brand new segment here on the program where old Nostra Corny gets to crow a little bit, and we're calling it Corny Crows. Should we keep playing us? <laughs> I, think, I think we made the point. All right. Uh, yeah. What are you doing out there in the chicken coop, <laughs> giggling with the with the chickens and the crow and the and the cocks and the and the the roosters? The rooster is a cock, right? I believe so. Would you stop that? <laughs> it's enough already. It's just there are all these compilations on YouTube's of roosters. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I don't even know if it's the same person just filming random roosters. Well, this one just jumped like six feet. All right. Corny yes. crows, you said. Corny crows. Anyway, boy, the production values we got on this show, they put serious radio to shame. I'll tell you that. Um, so a few weeks ago, people were up in arms and it made the, the news on the sites and people were just talking about it. A lot of people saying it that they were going to bury Karrion Cross because he had debuted on Raw and had lost to Jeff Hardy. 
just got beat. And remember, we we looked at it. So boom, just there you go. Well, thanks for coming, NXT champion. Currently holds the belt. You get beat by Jeff Hardy on Raw in a couple minutes. And I said the only, but he, uh, Karrion Cross didn't have Scarlet with him, and everybody was up in arms about that. Oh, how can they break them up? How can they beat Karrion Cross? How can they break them up? And I postulated the theory. The only thing that I could think of in my mind that made that make any kind of sense to anyone would be that it sounded like something that an idea that either Vince McMahon would have or that someone would pitch to him that he would love that Karrion Cross would get beat until somehow Scarlet was introduced into the picture and then she would rejuvenate him or or elevate him or all of a sudden it would change this downward proje- trajectory that his career was on. I said that sounds like either a Vince McMahon idea or something that he would like if somebody said it. That's basically where we left that first conversation, right? Right. Feel, feel yeah, I was right. Right. feel feel free to agree. I agree. Is that, yes. That was factual. So you were just you were entranced by my storytelling. So <laughs> then he was booked in a rematch against Jeff Hardy the following week on Raw. And people are like, what the fuck? But they couldn't have that because, as we know from the loose-lipped concert promoter, Jeff Hardy got to COVID. So they put Karrion Cross in a, a, again, uh, or instead of Jeff, they put him in against Keith Lee. And for whatever Keith Lee has done to somebody, they couldn't even, for the sake of the story, allow Keith Lee to win anything. So Karrion Cross beat Keith Lee and really buried him pretty deep. But now the news came out, the rumors and innuendos and suppositions and whatever uh, has come out from the WWE insider circle that guess what the idea was all along <laughs> that they may or may not still do now because Jeff Hardy got the COVID, was to beat Karrion Cross until Scarlett was introduced into the picture, and then I think the quote was she would somehow unleash the warrior inside Karrion Cross. What does that mean? Well, that means he'd start actually being a badass and winning instead of getting beat up by, you know, a guy 50 pounds smaller that hadn't been pushed in three years oh, on a, television. That's unleashing the warrior. That's unleashing the warrior. All right. I thought it was more like getting blown on a raft at midnight or something. Hey, that's that sounds like a country song gone wrong. <laughs> but but anyway, and then I had people uh, on Twitter. I didn't have people, but I saw people on Twitter say, "Well, see, we it's storytelling. We knew there was more to the story. Remember, we never said it that was a good story. I just said that was the likely story. I think it's ridiculous in That's this day right. and age to debut a guy like Karrion Cross on the big show and beat him. I know they think that Scarlett's going to be a big star because look at her, but she's going to be just as big a star whether she's with a guy that wins from the start or she comes along and he starts winning. It's going to be the 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 Sonny and Sable effect anyway. She's going to be a star, but he could possibly be a star also, unlike Mark Marrow or poor Chris Candido, if they gave people some confidence in him and instilled some credibility in him with people watching him that, that he is a big star and not just some schlub that gets beat by honest and I'm a I've been a Hardy fan in the past Jeff poor Jeff hasn't mouthed off at me lately uh but his day is past and he's smaller and he's he's an established veteran guy that still has value but he shouldn't have been just beaten carrying cross in a cold tv match it's just ridiculous regardless of what the story so you had people on twitter going see it's long-term storytelling it may be. It's just a bad story. But I told you, Brian, a lot more people ought to start listening to me because I do the thinning around here, and generally these things somewhat come to pass. We'll talk more about the the big one of the week later on, but 
It's not like I'm a goddamn mind reader. It's just that that sounds like something that Vince McMahon would do or say or think. And in the case that we're going to talk about later on, I've been crowing about this for 20 years that these idiots can't figure out. Don't piss your sponsors off by having them unknowingly sponsoring a goddamn sideshow exhibition. But anyway, so there there may still be hope for Karrion Cross in the WWE universe is what the 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 uptake of this whole thing is, is it maybe just because Jeff Hardy got the COVID, maybe they'll bring somebody else in and let them beat him too, and then they'll still bring Scarlett in and let her resurrect him. The whole thing's not gone to shit yet. It just it it'll be gone to shit shortly. Such a bad idea. Even the losing gimmick leading to a win, how many times has it been done by a heel versus a babyface? Well, but also, he's not the right kind of guy. Yes, Barry Horowitz got attention with a losing streak. Everybody remembers that. And then all of a sudden he gets a win. Or in this case, if the, if the, the addition of the lady at his side is supposed to rejuvenate him, then couldn't he be some kind of for lack of a better term, kind of smart-ass chicken shit, smarmy heel to where the, okay, now he's got the girl and she can interfere, she can pump him up or she, whatever, or tickle him under the chin. And and then he he somehow, uh, you know, it gets a better record, but not a big, badass-looking guy like Karrion Cross. And he and Scarlett, besides being a real-life couple, look so good together and they got their shit down together. Bring them in and let them do their thing. Don't monkey with it and make it so either complicated or overly dramatic. (sighs) Anyway, he's still the NXT champion, you know. That's the crazy part. I forgot until you just said that. I had forgotten all about the fact that while he's doing this losing gimmick or started it, he was the NXT champion. Well, yeah, on the same network. One night away, on Monday night, he's a schlub that gets beat by Jeff Hardy with no fanfare, and on Tuesday night, he's the champion of the organization that badass Samoa Joe wants to get a hold of for doing what he did to poor old William Regal. Jesus Christ. (laughs) It's the same network. And speaking of which, NXT on July 27th. I said, you know what? Samoa Joe last week, he's after Karrion Cross. Karrion Cross got a hold of William Regal in the parking lot. I didn't like that part because it was so fucking phony, but Samoa Joe did a great job. So let's see what they're going to do this week. And guess what? <laughs> Karrion Cross wasn't there. They let him get a win on Monday night, but the champion of NXT, but Samoa Joe was able to cover up for it. There were... There were three takeaways from NXT this week. I didn't watch the the whole show. I zipped through a good part of it because I wanted to see the main event business. And the only part that I didn't stop on that I would have was Frankie Monet, but she was in a tag team match with a couple of little skinny girls, and I just didn't give a shit. Um, But otherwise, here was the sum total of main event shit that I was really interested in on NXT this week. The opening of the show, Samoa Joe stalks to the ring, reaches under the ring, grabs a fucking table, throws it in, grabs a chair, throws it in, sets him up, puts his binder down on the table, takes the microphone and tells the people why he's there. Because Karrion Cross is too scared to be there tonight because he knew what, what was waiting for him. So now he wants to call out, Samoa Joe does, he wants to call out William Regal to this ring, and he's not going anywhere until he sees William Regal. And Regal comes out, and Joe does a great promo. He lays it all out. He's mad, he's serious, he's pissed off, and he wants something. He tells Regal he knows that Regal is going to fire Karrion Cross for what he did last week, and he doesn't want him to do that. Because Joe has a three-step solution. And he opens his binder and he lays out one piece of paper. And he said, first, this is my official resignation as your assistant or whatever the 
the title they gave him uh, as management in NXT. This is my, my resignation. Second paper. This, William Regal, when you sign it, will put me back on the active roster as a wrestler. And the people pop. And Regal looks at it, and he reaches down and signs it. And they pop again. And then Joe says, but I said there were three. This was a three-step solution. And then he lays out the contract. This is a contract for me to wrestle Karrion Cross for the NXT Championship at TakeOver 36 on August 22nd. And Regal looks at it and signs that. And the people go crazy. They, the people go banana, as Pat Patterson would say. And they shake hands. And I want to see it. It was simple. It was serious. It was straightforward. You've got a guy that can talk that looks like a fucking wrestler telling the, the boss that he wants a goddamn piece of another guy that looks like a fucking wrestler. And they made it legitimate, reasonable. There, were no, there was no winking going on. There was no clown assistants hanging around in funny outfits. And I want to see that. And that was the first five minutes of the show. And it didn't take 20 minutes either. And I want to see that match. Now, the question is, Brian Last, what the fuck is takeover on these days? Do we have, is that, the, is that the, the peacock? I'm not sure because takeover is also where they're doing the Walter Ilya match, right? Well, you're jumping ahead of my notes, but yes. I will find out. Take over 36 on August 22nd, because then after Samoa Joe's open of the show, I started fast forwarding and I fast forwarded until I caught something else that I really wanted to see, which was Valter's face because they had Triple H and Shawn Michaels and somebody else. There was three of them. I can't remember. Possibly Regal. I don't know. But, um, they announced that that match had been postponed, but now they could say because they wanted the whole world to see it, the rematch between Valter and Elia will be at TakeOver 36 on August, August 22nd. So how can we watch this show? There's two matches right there I want to fucking see. And I will tell you then... And no one has you, a firm answer. I mean, I'm assuming Peacock, you but I'm not seeing anyone actually say, watch it on Peacock. <clears throat> oh god damn not it. Not one <laughs> article I pulled up so far say where to watch it. <laughs> That's like all these outlaw promoters these days put up the fucking their posters on the internet and it's worldwide and they have the fucking town that they're in without the state. And nobody knows what where the fuck is this, Danville. Anyway, uh and the main event on this program was Adam Cole against Bronson Reed. And I wanted to see this because, as you'll recall, and we're going to uh, recap here in a few minutes, Bronson Reed is one of the guys that I picked for my WWE roster. He's young. He looks he looks younger than they'll let you believe he is. They keep talking about him wrestling for 14 years. But he's like, he's Crusher Blackwell, young and in shape. He moves. He lo his shit looks good. He's got potential. He's not there yet. But I wanted to say, okay. He's going to look probably as good against Adam Cole as, as anybody in a longer match. He's had some really impressive short matches. Um, and this match was, it, obviously it was Adam Cole leading, but Cole put over their size difference by being flung around by the bigger but slower guy, the bigger and stronger guy, but the slower guy. They took their time. Adam Cole went to start working on the leg. I mentioned Bronson Reed's power shit looks good, but he needs to work on. There was periods of time he should have been registering the leg and he didn't when he would just forget about it because he was going to the next thing. But they still kept a baby face and heel dynamic, even though Adam Cole was the heel, the smaller guy, and he was selling a lot at first to get Bronson Reed's power over. He was selling like a heel and Bronson Reed was doing this Brutal shit like a baby face. Like, you deserve this. Almost. So they got that body language down. Um, they went through the break and kept people with it. Adam Cole, as I mentioned, was having a Bronson Reed match because Bronson Reed can't have an Adam Cole match. So this was how that this would work, and it did. 
And Cole worked the leg to keep the big man off balance. I will say if Bronson Reed is listening, there were periods of time where he was selling the leg and he was selling on his face, but he was on his back laying there selling his leg. And a guy that size, if you're selling in a stationary position, you've got the danger of looking too much like a beached whale. And you're and you're just it it gives the people a a a feeling even if they don't see it right off or they don't see it consciously this guy's just, he's just laying around a big guy like that selling a leg needs to be waving his arms and fighting and grabbing the ropes and still feeding the leg to the heel but trying to get up and being jerked back down a lot more you can't just lay there when you're that big of a guy you're that powerful I'm not saying don't sell. I'm saying don't sell stationary. Be more active. Make the guy jerk you back down or jerk your leg out from under you or at least be trying to reach for shit or pawing for stuff. <clears throat> Do not just lay there and project shade. Anyway, and uh, Bronson Reed started a comeback by just really by just fighting back and starting to swing more and overpowering Adam Cole, Chops, whatever. Again, a guy this size with that amount of power, but he's not the quickest person. You know, we've seen a few of these big guys that are really fast also. Bronson Reed's not necessarily that fleet of foot, but Bronson Reed needs a comeback. He needs a trademark hookup. He needs some kind of thing where the heel can accidentally stop himself for a second so that all of a sudden... Reed can go from selling to standing up to looking at the people to fucking, you know, getting that look on his face and do something with the, 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 the drop in the strap, the cup in the ear, the, all the things that baby faces have done as a trademark thing when they hulk up over the years and it wasn't invented by Hulk Hogan. It's, it's just the name it's gotten. He needs one of those so that the baby face can then get the shocked face and fucking put the hand out and take the step back like, oh shit, now he's unleashed. Anyway, uh, Bronson Reed at one point reversed a suplex into some kind of move that looked great if that's what he meant to do. I've never seen that exact turn before. Um, Reed needs some snap on his punches, but then you can't teach this size and you can't teach this ability to move like that. Um, Adam Cole hit the Panama sunrise, which I, he does as much as he can to make it look like it's actually a move that you could do with getting up on a second buckle and the extra jump and everything. But I still, I just don't like, cause does it look as preposterous to you as it does to me, regardless of what, who's doing it. And especially in this case, this guy's 350 pounds easily. And Adam Cole did it. What do you think? I completely agree with you. I'm not saying I hate it or anything, but it looks completely preposterous. And I think the Canadian Destroyer in general looks completely preposterous. So, uh, you know, that's... And everybody says, oh, he doesn't find any fault with people he likes. Well, I love Adam Cole, but I don't like that move. Uh, Bronson Reed had a nice fucking comeback, hit him clothesline, power bomb, and then missed his splash off the top, and Adam Cole hit the super kick, boom, and then the running knee to the back of the head, boom, one, two, three. It was a good finish because in their pecking order and the way everybody's been presented, Bronson Reed probably should do a job at this point for Adam Cole, but it was competitive and it was close, and Bronson Reed missed his finish. And then Adam Cole didn't hit him with 16 things and beat him flat, which we'll, we'll talk about later. He hit the super kick after the guy missed his move, and that knocked the guy loop, loopy, and then he hit the knee to the head and capitalized on it. Boom. So it wasn't, it wasn't Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly. It wasn't a classic, it wasn't Flair and Steamboat, but this Bronson Reed's got something, and it was a good match that made sense. Then. At the end of the, the episode, right as we're about to go off the air, the place where you should shoot an angle, guess what they did? They shot an angle. Kyle O'Reilly came out and whacked Adam Cole a couple times with a fucking chair and then picked him up and gave him the... It was a suplex. They were 
trying to intimate that it was a brain buster, but it was a vertical suplex flat of his back on the steel stairs and left Adam Cole laying. He didn't proceed to fucking eviscerate him, hang his bowels out to fucking dry, bring his intestines out of the, you know, he just whacked him a couple times with a chair and suplexed him on the steps and left him laying there while he was standing over him. So, golly gee whiz, could we have some Colin O'Reilly on TakeOver 36, please? It seems like they're going in that direction. This could be the show of the year. If only we knew where to watch it. If only they would tell us what it's on, yes. Hey, Bronson Reed losing the coal. Do you read anything into it that he's done dark matches? or Did he work on main event, or was it just dark matches before recent uh, tapings, I guess we still call them, so Vince could see him? I, I do not know the answer to that question, but I I know that when Vince was down at the Performance Center, several of the people, including Karen Cross and Bronson Reed, came up to get a look, and he's he's trying to find him some new stars, and he doesn't trust anybody else to do it. So that may be why the Karen Cross has the, uh, the, the cross to bear of having Vince as a fan of his right now. We'll see what happens. But anyway, but that was my thoughts on NXT. It, it didn't take long to watch the show. One match, an interview at the start, a match announcement in the middle, and a main event at the end. Otherwise, everybody was professional. Nobody did anything stupid. Certainly nobody got the, you know, the sponsors to revolt and drop the program. It just wasn't a lot of people I was interested in. Where over on the... On the other channel, you have constant chaos and unprofessionalism and uh, the, the chance that somebody's going to get seriously injured at every second, which is, I guess, why that appeals to the same kind of people that go to the car race to see the fucking guy run into the wall. But it wasn't an exciting program, but I saw a, a wrestling match and a wrestling promo. So there we have it. Really and, makes you miss the old compilations and tape trading. It was so easy to just go through oh, various promotions, see yes. the highlights, best promos, best angles, best matches, and not have to sit through everything. Imagine if you had to sit through everything to see that stuff. There was a guy named Marty Slobin in, in the Michigan, Detroit area that was one of the first guys that I traded tapes with. And because tape was expensive back, a, a two-hour VHS tape blank at the mall in January of 1980 was $25. So he didn't tape the whole, well, I taped the whole show, and, but most people didn't tape the whole show. So a lot of people, what they would do is they would make compilation tapes, and Marty sent me a six-hour tape that had everything from Mid-South to Mid-Atlantic to uh, The Sheik in Detroit to blah, blah, and you just watched the matches and interviews that people were most interested in that had made the compilation, and that made it a lot easier, a lot easier to get through everything. But anyway, wish we had that today. Speaking of getting through everything on the drive through beginning this coming week, uh, we're going to be featuring SmackDown thoughts because you and I talked here, what, last week. They've got Roman Reigns now. Paul Heyman is always gold whenever they let him do anything. Um, Baron Corbin. Oh, you like Baron Corbin. You want to see it too. You can admit it now. After the what? last promo we listened to and the one before that that we read, come on, you can admit it. You want to see what's going on with the former King Corbin. Did you see the I news? Will, uh, uh, what? The news that I read was WWE has copyrighted the name or trademarked the name Happy Corbin. No. So let's see where this goes. Oh, my God. I was about to say, if, if he's going to continue <laughs> to rib their creative by saying these off-kilter things in these promos and getting by with it, I might want to watch him. But anyway, um, but they have Heyman. They have Reigns. They have a variety of stars. We're going to give SmackDown a, a chance and report on some of those happenings beginning on the drive through That's and, right. Uh, and the, the, we're going to... Because we've still got more to go here. We've got uh, the the AEW TV review sponsored by Domino's yet to come, so we won't go deep into the roster business that we've been doing the last couple weeks. But to recap, the WWE roster that I picked last week, the grade eight are Valter, Randy Orton, 
Bobby Lashley with MVP, Roman Reigns with Paul Heyman, Bronson Reed, Damian Priest, Samoa Joe, Karrion Cross with Scarlett. The next eight, AJ Styles, Austin Theory, LA Knight, Seth Rollins, whatever they're calling Dijakovic these days, Cesaro, Drew McIntyre, and Odyssey Jones. The tag teams are Colin O'Reilly, Balor and Champa, Ziggler and Rude, Shelton and Gable, Fish and Strong. Sounds, sounds like a companion magazine to Field and Stream. Fish and Strong and Owens and Zane. I, I should mention also the special attractions that don't count on the full-time roster are Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Rey Mysterio, and Edge, and the women's roster, Charlotte with Bailey as her manager, Rhea Ripley, Becky Lynch, Tony Storm, Frankie Monet, Bianca Belair, Shayna Baszler, and Raquel Gonzalez, if she's banned from doing that reverse Vader splash, and all other people would be brought in to bounce off of these stars that were the core of the territory. That's what we did last. That's what I did last week with my summer vacation. That's right. So next week, we've already got so much to talk about, about these mullets coming up, but next week, should we do the AEW roster off their website? Same way we did this and see if we can gel it down to something coherent and potentially palatable. Is that a thing we should do? Well, for the record, because we've questioned it and not taken the time and shown any effort to actually look, I have just done so. The AEW roster is, in fact, on their website. So we I can do this. I thought you told me that it was one time before. Or no, remember we thought went, it was. We went to AEW.com, but it was some, like, semiconductor company. Oh, that's right. That's right. We found the wrong website. Okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But we have right, it here, boy. and uh, we can, boy, oh, boy. Jesus, this is bad. <laughs> okay, well, that'll be something that uh, that we can look forward to next week. Well, hold on. Let me ask you, though. The oh. whole philosophy behind this segment, which you, you introduce and people like it. Yes. It's basically you're going down the roster. And last time, all I did was say, I'll take this person. If it was someone you were throwing away. Yes. I basically just took your scraps for my little promotion. This yes, because I don't view you as competition. Are we doing the same thing? When are we going to have a draft where you and I both have to go back and forth and then there's a real challenge? Why don't you didn't even keep your notes? I've got to dig up my notes on your on your picks. That's not true that I didn't keep my notes. You didn't have them with I you. I didn't hey, take you, notes. You did, Okay, you didn't, you didn't keep them because you didn't take them. See? You, you were just you lying. You just lied. These, okay, you were willy-nilly committing these people that you wanted to memory. I could find a list. We have some dedicated listeners who could put together a list. But again, back to I my, have the list. You have my list. Yes, I got everybody's list. Because I write everything down. Can you fax it over? I, I could if you had a fax machine. I ha Actually, I do have a fax machine. It's just not hooked up. Oh, well, same here. Yeah. But I'll anyway. I'll just read them to you later. One okay. of these days, I mean, we're doing the roster. You pick your guys. We should do a draft where we each have to put together a roster based on who we draft. I think we ought to we ought to do the WWE roster, then we ought to do the AEW roster, and then we ought to see how quick it would take the WWE roster to kick the teetotal shit out of the AEW roster, stick their toes in their ears, shake them upside down for change, and leave them broke, busted, and disgusted on the side of the road. I can't wait for you to look through this roster page. Some of these photos of the people. Forget about what you think about the people. When you see the photos, you're like, why this? And it also has their records. I didn't even know they were they were uh, that musical. What what? How many records have they released? What do the songs sound like? Well, Matt Seidel apparently is eleven and four in twenty twenty one overall, fifteen and eleven, and his career is I, what? Hold on, this is laid out really weird. He's zero and two in trios matches, three and five in tag team matches, eleven and four in singles matches, fifteen and eleven in twenty twenty one. Trios matches. That's a thing they say now. Anyway, so that'll be next week on this program and next week on the, the drive through And before we talk about their current program, you've got all kinds of stuff going on at the Arcadian Vanguard Network. New shows approaching, old shows phasing out, all kinds of stuff happening. Another action-packed week and an action-packed period of time right now for the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows. That was my chair. Get information about all the shows 
on Twitter. Oil it. Oil it. At Super Podcast or on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, and Jim, like you just referenced there, some changes coming to Arcadian Vanguard, and I want to announce some schedule and roster changes coming right now, actually. It's actually in effect. But I've decided to end Arcadian Vanguard's working relationship with Ron Fuller and the Studcast and John Arezzi and Pro Wrestling Spotlight. Effective immediately, both shows, by the time this airs, have been notified. Different reasons for different shows, but in both cases, this decision is in the best interest of Arcadian Vanguard, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that me and my team, Jace Nakarado, Lou Kippelman, Jake Hammer, me and my team have done on these shows. Wait a minute, where you been hiding Jake Hammer? Well, he doesn't work on this show. I'm afraid of what you're going to do to him considering his name. You're just going to play with that for weeks and weeks on the air, and I like it to can't play end with well. the hammer. Well, that's right. But like I but said... you're proud of the work they've done. Like I said, different reasons for different shows. With Ron, I wish him good health. However, I've decided this is what was best. And with John, there is a crazy and hysterical story, which I will tell in more detail on 605. But in a nutshell, I'll, I'll try to summarize this, but it's so crazy. When we first started the show and John came here to meet with me in my office and we talked about it, shortly after that, he met with someone who I guess you could say is kind of a bulbous and ballless guy who produces what is widely considered worthless garbage content whose only intention is to rob people of their money. John met with him trying to see if there was any deal to be made. At that time, there John wasn't. John met with him to try to rob him of his money? <laughs> well, maybe that too. But John came back and it was all about how badly the guy wanted to work with me and talk with me and how upset he was that I wouldn't even respond to his request that I be part of his convention. and. I just said, John, I'm not interested. If you want to go work over there, do it and get as much money as you can. But I'm not interested in sharing and I'm not interested in working together, period. And for the most part, that's where it was left. Come a few years later, John has a lot of things going on, a lot of things he's trying to make happen. And recently, uh, John has reopened talks. I believe he was reached out to and then opened talks for a number of things. And it is extraordinary. It is so crazy. It includes everything from six figures for one thing to a national radio show to being executive producer of a documentary to getting Eric Bischoff involved. And I, I understand also DoorDash was going to deliver the second course from The Last Supper to John's home. You know, what? like I said, more information and details on 605, but it's an extraordinary story that I'm still laughing about. But most importantly to me, John was in negotiations about being on-air talent for the futureprowrestling.com that that garbage outfit is trying to launch pretty soon. And I told him, I said, John, as I told you before, I have no interest in sharing talent for a multitude of reasons. You put a couple of years of your time and effort into the program, as we've been talking about here on, on this show for quite a while now. I can actually say that John's show takes up more production time than any other show on my schedule. And actually, John's show... That's because we do everything in one take. Yeah, well, John's show takes a lot of work. And like I said, it was a team effort, and we did a great job. But point is, when John opened up talks about being on-air talent, I told him that was a deal-breaker for me, which he knew. But still, a lot of carrots were dangled over John's head, and John sees a lot of zeros dancing off. <laughs> so he's interested, even though it may seem like something else to some other people. I gave John a negotiating window. He had it. He came back. There was nothing, but what he said was there was nothing imminent. Not, I'm not interested, or not, I made a mistake, or not, what was I thinking, but nothing was imminent. As Mama Cornette used to say, he wouldn't either shit or get off the pot. He was trying to keep both of those options open. Well, he said nothing was imminent, and he also said he wanted to continue doing the show, but at this point, I can't justify my time or my team's time and all the time it took to work on a show, considering John is looking for every available option, even if it means going to garbage content. So I wish John well. I like John. I like John a lot. And John's an honest guy. And I really think John's a good guy. I just wouldn't do business the way he does business <laughs> or with some of the people he does business with. But I, I sincerely wish John the best. But both these decisions in the best interest 
of Arcadian Vanguard. And by the way, not cool to negotiate with people who are on another network, but we'll deal with that. We will be dealing with that in the future. But of course, Dum -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, call Stephen P. New. The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny that all of a sudden I have time to work on my incredibly popular Mothership once again? <laughs> and that's what we're doing. 605 is in full production mode right now. Multiple segments being worked on, edited, and episodes are being worked on. Stay tuned for more information. One other note, can't say too much more about this, but for the last four months, we've been working on a new show that's going to be debuting in September. More information to come, but I think fans of wrestling history, specifically history from the 80s, are really going to love this. We're really proud of this and a really cool show. More information to come, but until then, go through the archive, 605pod.com. The Mothership! God damn it. All right, we might as well get to it. The review of AEW's Fight for the Fallen from July 28th. And hey, that even shows that even dumb people can do good things, right? If it's for a good cause, the Fight for the Fallen. Anybody they can just, do a good thing, of course. They just, they can't get out of their own way. Um, It was the, uh, the old Charlotte Coliseum, what are they called? They For a while, they called it the Bojangles Arena. I'm afraid they still do, but it's the old Charlotte Coliseum. Uh, and they had a nice crowd there. I believe they said, what did they say? They had six or 7,000 people in there. That's not bad. for. No. And it know, was up. For, and it was up from the last time they were in Charlotte. That's not bad for the amateur hour. That's the same building that the Rock and Roll and Midnight Express sold out, 12,000 people. Actually, we had... Four shows there over a 10-week period and sold 43,000 tickets to him. But nevertheless, who's picky? But the program, you're going to talk about the momentum that they've got, and I'm going to talk about the mass hypnosis that they have perpetrated. This reminds me of when the Ultimate Warrior was the hottest thing in wrestling, only on a smaller, you know, smaller scale because there were more people watching in the 80s. But Vince managed to commit mass hypnosis and convince a large majority of the people for a short period of time that the ultimate warrior was a good wrestler and the kids loved him. The difference is the ultimate warrior didn't get good star ratings because although the people in the room liked those matches, the fans that bought the tickets, a lot of the smart fans didn't, but nowadays it's the opposite. Oh no. Uncle, uncle Dave gave him negative one, even though the people were fucking screaming and throwing babies in the air for the ultimate warrior, but the, the matches were rotten. So uncle Dave gave him, you know, one star, two stars or negative one or whatever, because he was being honest back in those days. I brought this up because of his star rating for the main event, but we go wait. If you want to talk about, that I later. don't even know what it is, but I can't wait to find out. Okay. But anyway, so Everybody was tweeting, is Cornet going to have a stroke over this show? Because there were so many things that you could. Or is Cornet, is all right, let's do a wellness check. At this point, you can't get mad. I don't know whether it's, whether it's to laugh if you didn't care about the business, whether it's just sad because you care about some of the people are used to on this program, whether it's embarrassing or a little combination of all of, or just a bummer. But they have created a product for people who want to laugh at professional wrestling and watch a bunch of idiots break their own necks and dive on their own heads. And they have momentum with this because the entire business of professional wrestling has mostly been rotten for so long that most everybody else that liked it has fucking long ago given up. So now this is what we have to look forward to, a niche audience of it still. It's a million people. It was a million one last week. It's a million one this week. It was 850,000 three weeks ago. It'll be back to 850,000 in a week or two. And then they'll bring out the latest high priced acquisitions and they'll be, but it's the same thing. It's a group of people that want to laugh at professional wrestling and watch a bunch of idiots jack off in public. How else can you explain this? The worse it gets. I know they're happy to be out in public again, all the fans. 
but the worse it gets, they can't see it or they won't admit it. So I, I, I don't know. It's, it's the, the first 30 minutes of this show was like one of the America's Got Talent audition shows where they're not even in front of people yet and the acts that don't make it, that get cut, that don't hit the fucking flip or don't do the trick right or whatever. It's They're not even being serious about trying to get on the live shows and pass the audition show because they think these people will eat up anything, and apparently they will. The opening 10-man tag. They do a, a, an open video for the Adam Page team, a cowboy video with apparently Wilford Brimley was doing the voiceover. They went to links to do the, it wasn't Wilford Brimley, but he had the same old country accent. It was a voiceover guy. And they, they did a video all about how Page is a cowboy and so is the dork order. The Dork Order were put in the position there on the Cowboy team. <sighs> and they did the elaborate stage entrance with Adam Page in between seven other gimmick guys with matching bandanas, but it's it was the best they've ever looked. Didn't you think the Dork Order? They cut they they had some color to them. They were all wearing kind of the same thing. They still had Sharpie marks on their chest, wearing stupid fucking masks, but they looked kind of halfway like something. They tried to dress them up. But then here comes the elite. And now they get a basketball team introduction. Did you notice the Hardly boys were both uh, announced as at six foot six? I mean, it was, it was a spoof six. of It's a spoof Space of everything. Jam, yeah. Oh, I, I was I've watching. Never, I've never seen that movie, so I didn't. I just thought it was a spoof of basketball. I was Why, watching you know. to see if Omega could dribble, though. Well, he, of course he can dribble. He does, he does that often, depending on how much he's got in his mouth. But the thing is, everybody comes out with a basketball. There's Don Fallis wearing shorts and black knee-high socks and dress shoes. They're, they're not even in the ring yet, and it's a clown show. They go into a dribbling exhibition. Then they've got an actual portable basketball goal, not regulation height. And they're shooting baskets. This is the fucking heel team coming to the ring like a bunch of fucking clowns. Nobody can ever bury the WWE for being a clown show and defend the first five minutes alone of this fucking stinker. It's just different clowns doing different fucking clown routines. And not e and actually not even taking the clown routine seriously. This is like a bunch of magicians laughing because they blow the fucking trick and drop the rabbit. So then it was a 10 man elimination tag team match between the jobbers and the comedians. And within 10, 15 seconds tops, they went into a 10 way right in the middle of the ring. Quadruple suplexes where four guys gave four more guys a vertical suplex. They all went to the floor for a, a short stage fight where they could do their quail spot or their coil spot, which they're either quails or coils, where the other two guys that didn't all get suplexed, they get up on the, on the turnbuckles and one guy superplexes another guy off the turnbuckle onto the pile that was waiting to catch them. And they replayed it twice with better camera angles where you could see the guys waiting to catch these guys with their hands out, like they were in the fucking outfield of, of Comiskey Park waiting for the fucking fly ball. They reap, not only do they do shit that looks bad, but they replay the shit to make it look worse. And this happened over and over again where their replays exposed shit. Because this shit doesn't stand the light of day and you can see through it. Then they did moves to each other as fast as they possibly could. Then the first person that got eliminated, nobody, not one of the announcers, nobody, nothing on the PA, nobody ever said to who the first guy was that got eliminated. Did you happen to note it or notice or be able to, it was one of the dork order fucks, but I don't know who they fucking are because they all look the same. I, anyway, then for some reason, all the heels just, 
lift Carl Anderson as soon as the, and this was within 15 seconds after the baby face got eliminated, or all the heels just left Carl Anderson in the ring with all four of the remaining baby faces. And while the heels were standing out on the floor, the baby faces each hit him with something and pinned him while his partners didn't do anything. And then as when the cover was happening, one of them tried to reach in, but it was just said that was the time he needed to go. So we're not going to try to stop anybody. Um, did you notice that the bald dork order character with the beard but no face paint looks like little Brutus and is, is about the same height also? I did not notice that, no. He looks like little Brutus. Oh, come on. Everybody Google little Brutus and then Google the little short dork order guy with no face paint. You're talking about John Silver? Yes. He was nothing. Yes, come on, right. little Brutus. Mm-hmm. Little Brutus. All right. Except little Brutus was more entertaining. Uh, actually, anyway. Um, every time that the baby faces were trying to do something and their shit might've gotten over that annoying little douchebag, Brandon Cutlet is horning in on the picture with the cold spray distracting from everything. He's constantly there spraying the heels with that stupid cold spray while the baby faces are trying to get over and it's just distracting. It's annoying. They go to a break. This match, by the way, went 30 minutes. I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Back from the break, the bald dork order with the face paint is beating up Gallows. And meanwhile, and this was right past the break, just if anybody wants to go back and look at this, Pie Face Buck is sitting on his ass in the baby face's corner in the turnbuckles, and all the baby faces are ignoring him, and they've walked down the ringside apron away from him because he has to sit there until the shit in the ring calls for him to be there, which we find out is the dork order character runs over to that turnbuckle, jumps over his opponent pie face to get to the top rope so that he can jump off onto gallows while pizzeria uno, the, the fat fuck in the S and M mask cannonballs under the dork order guy jumping off the top so that he can hit pie face who laid there and waited for it the whole fucking time. Then they did the spot where fat fuck Uno catches the guy's kick and hands the guy's leg to the referee who holds it accidentally so that Uno can do something. Then I swear to God, and this was, this was tweeted a lot and I retweeted it. Everybody rolled out to the floor again and actually just didn't worry about fighting, just huddled up and bent over and looked up, bracing themselves so the bald-headed face-painted dipshit in the dork order could turn his back on them, jump from the apron to the top rope, and come off backwards with a double-twisting pike and went straight through the middle of all eight of them to the floor, back first, nearly killed himself, and then all eight guys that he didn't touch fell down individually. And they replayed that twice. And you could see a better shot of all the people, friend and foe alike, falling down that hadn't been touched, because this is fucking garbage. <laughs> and... <laughs> And this fucking guy took the a, a backdrop off the top rope straight to the floor is basically what he did and then just got back up because he was just embarrassed because he just fucked up in front of everybody. I don't know why he was embarrassed. Nobody even notices. It's just constant. And then they continued the match. And then this was, I'm not lying about this one, Gallows and the bald dork order fellow fought into the arena where the, it was the little Brutus, I think it was. Was it little Brutus there? No, it wasn't. It was the other one, the one with the face paint. Uno's partner. Um, Braveheart. He dove off the side of the bleachers on Gallows with a double hammer fist. Guess what happened to him, Brian? They'd been out there in the in the arena probably about 30 seconds. Guess what happened to him? You know, so you don't have to guess, yeah. but just... They got counted out and the crowd booed because 
Every it's this is that now people are going to say, "Oh, Cornette's always fucking hot." When they don't get counted out, well, now they're doing something about it. They got counted out. Yes, after two years, people can just leave the ring, fight as long as they want, go out in the crowd, go out in the bleachers, go out in the goddamn parking lot. Nothing. They've never had a count out. These people are out there less than fucking 30 seconds. They just went there specifically so they could get counted out, and they both got counted out at the same time. And then the people booed. A count out? You're, you're enforcing rules? That's what you get when you just decide to start enforcing the rules two years into a fucking project. You get people booing them, and it looks stupid because now you've already set up expectations. Okay. Suddenly, now there's like four guys out, so there's still six guys, but all of a sudden, Twinkle Toes and Uno are the only guys in the match. There's nobody else in the ring. There's nobody else on the apron. There's nobody else in sight of the camera. So that they, Twinkle Toes and Fatso Uno, the cousin of Ratso Rizzo, can do lucha spots, two fucking white, not white guys, two translucent guys doing lucha spots by themselves with nobody else in the match. They're just gone. And then Twinkle Toes hits the one winged fairy on this fucking baked potato in a bodysuit and pins him one, two, three. And then a little Brutus starts beating up Pie Face, and we go to the break again. We come back from the break. Little Brutus is in the middle of kicking the shit out of all the fucking heels who have apparently in the break, so that they have to tell us about it and replay it, a major happening in the match happens during the break. They power bombed Adam Page on the apron, the heels did, and Page is out of action. So now. It's up to little Brutus, but he's killing everybody until, wait a minute, Twinkle Toes hits the, the V trigger. I finally found out where he got that from. Brian, he got, it's the vagina trigger. Oh, come on. And he got it from the vagina monologues. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Somebody said he got it from a video game. That's ludicrous. He got it from the vagina monologues. So he hits the vagina trigger. On little Brutus, who doesn't take a bump on this big hot finish. He just turns around and Balding Buck super kicks him. He doesn't take a bump on that. He just turns the other way. So the Twinkle Toes tries to get the Snapdragon suplex, you know, the tulip suplex he does on him with the full Nelson, but Brutus's arm kept blocking Twinkle Toes and he couldn't get it. So he just Germaned him. And that's when little Brutus actually took a bump after he'd been. Vagina triggered and super kicked and snapdragoned or German or whatever. So then he rolls out of the goddamn ring, the baby face does, and Twinkle Toes grabs a basketball and gets on the apron. And Balding Buck is in the ring, and Pie Face Buck gets the poor baby face in an upside down tombstone pile driver position on the floor and balding buck springs to the top rope, grabs the ball that twinkle toes has flipped him, goes to do the dunk, misses the dunk and then falls on his ass in front of the guy who got tombstone pile driver. I guess that's called the dementia driver in honor of their favorite uncle. This looked ridiculous. He missed the dunk. He missed the assist on the move. The guy got dropped on his head anyway. They obviously don't give a fuck about this fucking cartoon match they're having. And the poor guy that had to be held in this position, what if goofball balding buck with his receding hairline had been more concerned about making the dunk, which he missed, than he was about fucking not landing on the guy. He could have landed on the guy's ass and drove him right straight down head first, which is probably why it looked so shit because he was trying to take care of the guy and not hurt him, which would have been a reason to not do this whole fucking move. They're just falling around and jacking off in front of people who are screaming and yelling for them. And I can only think that they're going to have a goddamn plummet into reality 
when people start stop screaming for this shit because they've seen it all and it's old and the joke isn't funny anymore, which jokes usually wear out. And all of a sudden, when people start seeing through their shit and they're not screaming at everything they do, I think most everybody on in the elite will have a nervous breakdown because it will be a shocking case of reality for them. So, anyway, continue, whether is this is embarrassing or insulting to the business or a parody of the business or whatever, suddenly, Paige is left on his own, so now he's okay and he's ready to go. He goes face-to-face with Twinkle Toes and they have a fight. And suddenly, all three heels just jump in and glom Adam Page and give him triple super kicks, two count. Then they just jump back in again and triple team him in front of the referee again, get another two count. Then old Harpo Fingerfuck, our favorite wrestling artist, gesticulates and finger points and literally skips to the ropes and flips around and fucking Page clotheslines him and then hits the fucking Cucamonga kids and then does his moonsault off the top to the floor onto all three of them, but at least he hit them. So there's something to be said for that. We're 30 minutes into this fucking thing. Then Page foils the Bucks maneuver and hits the Buckshot Lariat on all of them, or on both of them, and pinned Pie Face. I don't, did he pin the other one? I couldn't keep track because Twinkle Toes gets one of the title belts and goes to hit Page, but the referee takes it away. And of course, it's the useless, feckless, corpse referee rick knox who now looks in all honesty like uncle fester on a starvation fucking diet just wrinkly and with dead flesh about him he's leaning out to put the belt out gingerly so twinkle toes gets another title belt behind the referee's back takes a swing and misses adam page Adam Page hits the fucking dead eye where he drops twinkle toes on his fucking head, gets a two count on Adam Page's finish. He's, he actually got one of the bucks on his buckshot, but he hits his dead eye and twinkle toes kicks out. The referee turns his back again and Harpo gets a title belt after taking this fucking top baby faces finish. Harpo gets a title belt and this time he hits him but gets a two count. Then Twinkle Toes, and this is where I remember I was talking about at least they capitalized. He didn't just beat him flat in the earlier match. I was talking about with Adam Cole and Bronson Reed. Twinkle Toes, whether he's just so ignorant, he doesn't realize it, or probably they just think it's okay because so many people do it these days. He beat Adam Page flat. He hit him with the title belt after taking the baby faces, one of the baby faces finishes. He fucking immediately turns around and behind the referee's back, supposedly, and the referee's already buried, hits Adam Page with the title belt and gets a two count, but then just picks him up and hits the one-winged fairy and gets a three count. He beat Page. How the fuck did they beat Page in this scenario? If he, if Adam Page had beaten Twinkle Toes, that whole building would have come all over themselves. And it wouldn't have mattered anything about their world champion because it wasn't a world title match. It wasn't a single match. How fucking hard should this have been? He beat Adam Page flat because if he'd hit him with the belt and beat him there, then he would have fucked him. But he didn't. Adam Page kicked out. Then Twinkle Toes calmly picks the guy up and hits his wrestling finish. The like what Adam Page did to Twinkle Toes moments before he hit his wrestling finish, Twinkle Toes kicked right on out. Then Twinkle Toes hits his and beats the guy. They are, you can't tell me they're not doing this on purpose to bury some of these fucking guys because nobody's that stupid. What'd you think? Let me start by saying before I say anything I think and a lot of your thoughts match mine, the crowd there loved it. The crowd there was going nuts throughout the Everything. whole fucking thing. And it's just actually, it, it, that's the one thing that did hurt my heart. Charlotte, North Carolina, especially that arena, all the great wrestling that they've seen, all the great talent that they saw for decades and decades, and it's been so long now, and those people have gone away, and now in that 
And now all their neighbors that didn't go to those shows, they have kids and those kids are attending AEW. And those kids are going and laughing at the wrestling business. And uh, partially on the backs of what we did because everybody at uh, Charlotte wrestling, we got to go. But now they're seeing this and they think it's somehow proper. And it that hurt my heart. Go ahead. Now, there have always been audio issues. Whoever watches on TV versus the app versus whatever else. Some people the, an- s- the announcers are sometimes JR sounds like he's coming from Mars and, right. and Tony sounds good and vice versa. Yeah. And sometimes you can't hear the audience. Now, I heard the audience loud and clear during this, and I heard from people that the audience was into the whole show. But to me, the audience got a lot quieter after this match. There are periods during matches where it got, again, at home. I don't know what is going on in the room. I'm just telling you what I perceive watching TNT on Fios. But it seemed like they did so much here for so long, like 40 plus minutes, that it was hard maybe for the fans to get into everything as much. This probably would have been a better main event if you didn't have that other match going on last, because this can't follow that, obviously. Well, at least if they'd have put this match on last, they wouldn't have lost any sponsors. The story is, and I'm going to assume, and I think it's a reasonable deduction that it's because of Punk or potentially Brian, or it could be Christian. That was teased. But the word going around today, I've seen it on Twitter before, is that AEW is not going with Hangman Page versus Omega at All Out. So looking at this decision, knowing that the next big event is not when, gonna when's be... he going to get another chance if they've got Brian Danielson and CM Punk coming in, Twinkle Toes is going to be busy. This at least gets Page's chance before he's completely floundering in the wilderness. But if they wanted his chance to be him winning the title, his chance should be him getting royally fucked and should have won the title. And then Twinkle Toes never wants to fucking face him again. That's the way you keep the guy fucking hot and keep people interested in him, not never give him the thing until finally, well, fuck it. He's playing with the dork order. He's never going to be the champion. He's never going to need a title match, whatever the fuck. Give him the title match. He should have won. He got fucked. And Twinkle Toes is scared to ever face him again. Oh, well, you're scared to face him? Well, look who we got. And then there's Brian or Punk or whatever the fuck. I wasn't crazy about the match. Look, I'm not into the Young Bucks and their style of match. And their style of layout of a match and just nonstop spots and the Stu Grayson spot where he just landed and you can watch the slow-mo, you see his head bounce. So stupid, so unnecessary. Like I said, the people that were there were super into it, but me watching at home, it was on for 40 minutes, so you couldn't, like, you know, just not pay attention to it, but it wasn't, in my eyes, a classic or anything. It was just they did another bunch of silliness, and then it kept going and do. going. And there was nothing left. There was no move left for anybody else to do by the time this thing was finished. That's why the people were quiet. They were like, well, there's nothing new. Anyway, um, did you love the interview with Pac? God, that guy, he looks like a million dollars. He has a mean face, great body. He can work. I wish he'd stop doing the thing off the top because it takes him 10 seconds to stand there and get his balance. But everything else is great. But goddamn, they gave him an interview that he it either he needed to work on it. It didn't make a lot of sense to begin with, but he finished it off. Did I wrote down his exact quotes? Bar Brady is with him. He says, and Bar Brady pitches to Pack with, "Well, Penthouse and Felix aren't here." And Pack says, "That's where you're wrong. They are here. They're at the airport." <laughs> well, the fucking airport isn't here. What the? F- it- That's where you're wrong. They're here. They're at the airport. Some anonymous individual canceled their car. That's the way I'd say it. Some anonymous individual canceled their car. And then here comes Chavo Guerrero, Andre Olio, Leo, and his assistant, who is, I think, yet to be named. And they've said they've gotten a limo for them, and they're on their way. And Chavo is great, but again, Andre spoke and was completely unintelligible. This is not a Hispanic person speaking English with a Mexican accent. This is a, this is the, is he the, and you know, I love Bobby. Is he the Bobby Eaton of the Mexican wrestlers? Can he just not speak? 
I'm not sure what exactly is happening here. I actually think he's probably one of the better Lucha guys that come to America and learn how to speak. Despite not well, I guess I haven't understanding what he said. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, next on the parade, literally the parade, we got the Dixieland Brass Band. I'm not kidding, folks. Taz introduced the new FTW champion, Ricky Starks. And as we all remember, the FTW title is what Taz created for himself in ECW, and Paul Heyman got it over because he was pushing Taz as a badass. Fuck the world. I've got my own title. And he was in the mix, and everything was great. And then, because Tony Khan's a mark for 90s ECW, Taz brought the belt, and Tony mentioned it four months ago, and they put it on fucking... Brian Cage, and then didn't do anything else with it. And then a couple of weeks ago, they thought, oh, wait, the FTW title. And then they've turned Cage babyface. He's the most ill fitting babyface I've ever seen against Ricky Starks, who just won the FTW title from Cage when the rest of Team Taz turned on Brian Cage. Did I actually summarize that in a sensible fashion? Yeah, in a sense. That's about what happened. So here comes Starks, and there's a Dixieland brass band wearing FTW shirts around the ring. He's from New Orleans. Yes, because Starks is from New Orleans, so therefore... But here's the problem. Yes, this is preposterous, but at least the WWE would have called New Orleans and gotten a goddamn Dixieland brass band from New Orleans. This was, I don't know if they were really playing. Some of them may have been really playing the instruments. But the other guys, I wrote before they even got attacked, these guys look like job guys. Uh, it, it wasn't great musicianship. They were a bunch of guys wearing T-shirts. They didn't have the Dixieland band outfits on. And the point I'm making is WWE would have spent the money put it in the budget, they'd had a professional band out there, it would have actually looked like something, even if it was preposterous. But instead, they had job guys playing a fucking tuba, and somebody that uh, apparently knew enough of how to play their instrument to keep them on some type of beat. But it it sounded kind of like the fucking band in goddamn uh, a the Andy Griffith show, the Mayberry Town Marching Band. Hold on. What was that? Had a fly. <laughs> anyway, so Hook was tagging along with Starks and a white wife beater and a goddamn, uh, and they said Hobbs was out recruiting because he's not there at all. So they, it just made, it made Ricky Starks, who we've talked about as a, a good talent, look so low rent with this clown show evolving around him. It was it was just outlaw. Starks did a good promo. He got wooded a little bit, but he did a good job of getting him out of it. And if any of the people that he was surrounded with in this were any good, or the booking had been any good, or anybody give a shit about the issue with the FTW belt, or Brian Cage, or Team Taz, who's never won anything ex except against each other, all that would have been great. But it wasn't. And then here comes fucking Cage, not Christian, but Brian Cage. You know, they got Cage, Cage, Page, Page, and Gage. Cage comes out and beats up. He stops and beats up the band. The guy that just fucked him and has been saying all these slanderous things about him and took his belt that he was given three months ago is in the ring, but he wants to stop and beat up the band and then bash the bass drum over the guy's head so it sticks over his head and you can see the guy hold his arms in and duck his head down before the prearranged spot where the drum goes over his head and then and as and then Jim Ross who is who's got to be contemplating his own suicide at this point on these fucking telecasts just live on the air JR said that bass drum may have had a family Jim Ross has made a commitment to do a job and he has never reneged on a professional commitment that he has made, but he cannot not be embarrassed to be a part of this. And then Cage 
grabs one of the band's trombones and comes in the ring with the trombone, and Jarrett says, there's no trombones in wrestling. Ed Starks throws a bouquet of flowers in Brian Cage's face, and he goes, and he just leaves the ring. And that was it. Help me. Try to understand what I missed here. Uh, what you missed was this was Monday Night Raw from a previous era, maybe the current era. I'm not sure. Enough with the championship celebrations. We've seen a few of these recently. Don't need to see any more of them. I like Ricky Starks. I like Team Taz. Hook has never worked a match that I've seen or done anything else. Will Hops is potential. I'm not really interested in seeing Brian Cage feud with any of them, but... I'm not really interested in seeing Brian Cage. He's the worst one of the bunch. Uh, next, we had a promo where Tanahashi spoke in subtitles. And who gave a shit? The same people that were already watching this show. Because go to the mall and scream, that's Tanahashi! See if anybody's head turns. Then what I had hoped for it actually delivered and then left me with a down feeling at the end. They actually broke into a professional wrestling match on this show with FTR and Tully in the corner against Santana and Ortiz with Conan in the corner. And we've been waiting for this. Not only just to see FTR wrestle, since it, we're deprived of that because the Bucks don't want people showing them up and a living illustration that they're not only not the greatest tag team in the world, they're not even the greatest tag team in the company. Is they don't want FTR on the program. We understand that. But still, they're paying them, so they might as well let them wrestle every once in a while. And we've wanted to see Santana and Ortiz because both of those guys have gotten in better shape. Ortiz has knocked off a lot of the comedy. Have you noticed this? Um, And, and they look like something. So I wanted to say, and Conan's in the corner because that ties in the thing with Tully. From the first lockup, this was at a higher level of professionalism than anything else on this program. It had to be embarrassing for these guys to be actual professionals and having to go out there and lock up after the Monty Python marathon that had preceded them. But they did it. And Cash Wheeler is fucking... He's really stealing a lot of the shows these days. We knew Dax was good. Let me jump in real quick, because obviously it's a story for later. I had that thought maybe around the same time you did. I'm watching Cash in there. I said, you know, taking nothing away from Dax. But Cash is maybe the most underrated guy in the business when he actually works, because everything he does looks good. He can move. He can do power moves. He knows how to work. I want to see more of him. Of course, we don't see enough of him, and now we'll see what happens when the next time we see him. But I had that thought during this match. This guy's the most underutilized and most underrated talent there, maybe. Yeah, and and he even he saved the monkey flip flub. But when he went, they were doing a high speed spot, and Ortiz was going to give him a reverse monkey flip as he was coming off the ropes, and it looked like that Ortiz put his his foot in Cash's nuts because he he went over sideways and not in a happy way. Uh, but the feet were off position some way. But he went over with the monkey flip sideways, turned and saved it, rolled out of the ring, and called time. Rolled out of the ring, laid on the floor, had been thrown out by the baby face and fucking did the fucking timeout. And the people popped on that because it was the payoff of a spot and they were allowed to digest what was going on. Then Santana and Dax trading the blows, they went a little long for me. Again, everybody has to stand there and not throw punches and wind up and deliver them and register them but they've got to just do forearms back and forth bang 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 it's with everybody but they take good Chris bumps Santana did the two amigos into a Santana and Ortiz double team deal and then Dax cut Ortiz off with the spine buster as a heat spot to go to the break imagine that the baby face in jeopardy when we go to the break not just some stupid dive that happens in every match uh and did have you noticed going to the breaks now they've apparently said to Sockface, old excrement, why don't you pitch us to the breaks? Cause they're <laughs> Tony's just happy to be there, and I think JR's trying to teach Sockface something so he can get the fuck out of there sooner or later. 
But have you noticed that now that he's pitching to the break, he's got he's yelling more and getting more mouthy and annoying. He's over the he's too much. He's over the top and he's reaching. Oh my god, this is happening. That's happening. The other thing's happening. We're gonna go to the break instead of folks. Dax has cut Ortiz off with that spine buster. He's in jeopardy. We've got to take a break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Anything like oh my god. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, during the the break, and this is another rib on FTR. And maybe here's a tip. Maybe if they're not paying close attention to the format, this is what I used to do. If you use, depending on how the show is formatted, a heat spot for the cutoff on the baby face is a good place to go to the break. But only if you have enough time on the other side in the next segment <clears throat> to get some of your heat in. Because what's happened over the last few years is tag teams will cut the baby face off for the heat for the break spot and all their heat will be unseen in the break. And when they come back from the break, there's the hot tag. I prevented that in most cases from ever happening to the Midnight Express because we saw how much time was in each segment and built it to where that we would start the heat and we would still be in the heat on the other side and we'd have a couple minutes of heat before we made the gave the tag and made the comeback because elsewise all your offense if you're a heel team is being edited out so what FTR ought to do is see how much time they and sometimes you need to go and you need to tell the producer or who's in charge of creative instead of 8 minutes and 6 minutes I need 6 minutes and 8 minutes cuz that way we can do two minutes of entrances. We can shine for three, do the cutoff spot for one. You're in the break for two minutes. You come back, you got eight minutes. There's four minutes of heat, a minute for the hot tag and a comeback, a couple minutes for the finish, and a minute for a wrap-up or afterbirth, just depending on what's going on. But no, we lost all FTR's heat in the fucking break. Then anyway, um, within seconds after coming back, from the from the commercial break, Ortiz kind of made a rushed, lukewarm at best hot tag to Santana, where really it just looked like, oh shit, we've got to go because we're running late. Probably because of that marathon abortion that took place in the first 40 minutes of the show. Anyway, Santana made a comeback, which was a bit all over the place. I... He... It, when a baby face comes in for an anticipated comeback and he takes time to start ducking things or setting up other things or going to other locations, first off, you lose some of your oomph that you got on that tag. It's important for the baby face to nail the heels two, three, four times with something in quick succession and then go to setting up something that takes a little longer to pay off because the people want to see some instant gratification which is why in the old days when everything actually drew most of the time when you got a hot tag and the new babe fresh baby face came in he'd stand in the middle of the ring and the fucking heels would feed him and they would take bumps to one side and the other to one side and the other and then the drop kick and then the fucking drop kick and then the whatever the fuck and whatever the fuck and they would feed the guy so that he could hit them as many times as possible while he had the momentum up. Anyway, everything got complicated from that point. And I know FTR is so precise, and I know they were running low on time, but if they didn't have more time, they should have cut cut out some of these moves back and forth because all of the tags and all the moves, it was like it was on fast forward. You couldn't keep track of what was going on but I'll be damned if they didn't hit everything and it all looked good and it made sense if you slowed it down and could process it. And if you overlooked people just getting up and doing more shit that quick right after something like that's been done. But at least it was professional. It was on, on point, just sped up. And that's when fucking hell. I believe this was going to be the finish that FTR went for the superplex splash combo. Let me let me stop you right there. Reportedly, there were several more minutes to go. Okay, well, I thought because of what they did that they were going for the suplex superplex splash, 
but it would be foiled, but then they'd nail it moments later. <clears throat> and maybe they would have, and it'd still be a two count. And maybe that's part of the problem. If they still had several more minutes to go, they had done way too much already. But FTR goes for the superplex splash, but Santana comes up and pushes Cash, who was going to do the splash, off the ropes. He landed with his feet back down on the apron, but you could see instantly he fucking jumped down. He hurt his arm and he, uh, and he walked off. The other guys started to continue. And then that's when Dax was looking over, like he was ready to give the superplex and he was looking over for him. And the referee had to tell him, no, go on to whatever the fuck referee told him. So he did the superplex and it's the Ortiz hooked the legs. A guy has been superplexed off the top rope and landed with that momentum, but he can just hook the guy that just gave him the superplex's legs. I've always hated that spot. I've been watching it for 30 years. I would never allow it to be done on my shows. I always vetoed every suggestion of it. It's fucking stupid. I hate they had to do this. But then Dax just basically ad-libbing, kicked Santana to the floor and hit Ortiz with a brain buster, one, two, three. And then they get a shot of cash, apparently... And people were saying this on Twitter. They were saying that he cut his arm on the turnbuckle. I don't think that was it, although I'm willing to be corrected. But I don't, I can't imagine, not only did they have a nice pad on the buckle, not only did they have a slip cover on the, on the buckle, I don't know what part of a turnbuckle would be that razor sharp that would cause a cut like that that bad I think it was the top of the ring post, and oh, I'll tell you why. Go I ahead. Th I thought it was the hook. But the hook ain't that sharp. Have you, you've you held turnbuckles in your hand, right? Sure, but if you land at it, you know, just a few miles per hour coming down and you hit it no, at the right angle. No, if, if, you, if, you, if you take a turnbuckle and hit somebody in the head with the hook, it will bust them open. Not because it is in, the hook is incredibly sharp, but because it's a blunt instrument and you've hit a bony area and it cuts from the outside in or the inside out. But I would think that you would be hard pressed to slice yourself in a fleshy area on any part of the turnbuckle, any part of any turnbuckle I've ever seen because they're not that sharp. It's a hook that goes into an eye bolt. It's not razor sharp. It's not, it's a dull end on a large hook. It's not like a fish hook. So I think, but somebody out there, if anybody from AEW wants to chime in on this, I've seen it happen before if the top of the ring post isn't capped. And I was looking, they're in Charlotte, North Carolina. The ring posts on their ring are square. I think it's a high spots ring. And I know they've got one turnbuckle at least where they've got one of those GoPro cameras on top of the ring post. That's where you see that angle every once in a while. But I couldn't see to tell, and I haven't gone back and I'm going to go back and look at it again. I didn't delete this from the DVR. But if the r top of the ring post isn't capped, that's what happened. If it was a high spots ring, and I'll tell you why, because in 2009... Delirious in Ring of Honor did the same thing. He went, he was going to be superplexed and he went to push with his hand off the top of the ring post and sliced, I mean, multiple stitches in the meat of the palm of his hand because there was no cap on the ring post and it hadn't been filed down. It was one of those high spots jobs, a cheap, shoddy piece of workmanship. And that's when, right as Sinclair was purchasing, Ring of Honor, I went and evaluated their ring, and it was a high spots ring that had been manufactured by high spots, and not a single bit of maintenance had been done on it since then, so it was shit going in, and it was shit coming out, and I viewed it a death trap, and told, there's another fly, there we go, I got him, <laughs> who says I don't draw flies, and I told Joe Coff, <laughs> it's a death trap if Sinclair's so worried about liability, and somebody getting hurt on their shows, and etc., that's where they're going to get hurt. So we set fire to that ring and we had Danny Davis build a, a brand new ring 
just like the WWE rings with not a, not the square four inch post, but the rounded six inch post, powder coated so they're smooth as a baby's ass. A uh, better size with the good foam that you could bump on, give in the middle properly, and decent flooring instead of the old rotten boards they had. But they didn't cap their ring posts. And a lot of people, would it surprise people, Brian, you're, you might have your finger on this, would it surprise people to know that the ring posts are not solid, they're hollow? Is that a surprise to people? It may be a surprise to some people, but I don't think it should be too much of one. Well, obviously, besides the fact that if the ring post was solid, five people wouldn't be able to pick it up. The the way that you the whether it's a round post or a square post, it's thick, durable steel, but it's not solid. It's hollow in the middle because that's the way that you you drill a hole in the thing and you put the bolt through to attach the turnbuckle to attach the ropes and etc. You couldn't drill through a completely solid piece of steel like that. But in the old days, uh, when, you know, every ring was different in every town because you didn't know who made them, a lot of times the posts weren't capped, and that's where guys would drop their blades so that nobody could find them. They'd they'd be run into the fucking turnbuckles or ring post or whatever and be bleeding and be hanging there, and they'd drop the blade down in the top of the post. It'd go all the way down to the fucking base, and who's going to take that up, right? So they're some of those old rings probably had 20, 30 fucking blades in some of the posts. Anyway, what the point is on the whole thing, if you do not cap the top of your post, you're looking down a tube and the the top of the post where it's been cut off by a torch or whatever, unless it's filed, ground, etc., can be sharp or capped and then you don't have to worry about it so i would i am going to throw out there that he did it on the top of the ring post and it was a high spots ring and i would appreciate if somebody would call me or text me or you can't text me but email me or tweet me and say no you're wrong he did it on the turnbuckle hook and here's why are you saying that aew uses high spots rings or that because they're in charlotte they're using one of their rings Possibly both, but since it's Charlotte, it would make sense that they didn't drive a goddamn ring from Florida. They just used one that was there. And they're there and you could see when the guys hit the ropes, the ring posts move. That's another sign of a high spots ring. They're not squared up good. Um but anyway, so that could be what it is. Hey, and there was one night in Memphis at the Mid South Coliseum, nineteen eighty one. The very first match, Roy Rogers, Tommy Rich's cousin. Uh, later on was Johnny Rich, but he was Roy Rogers then. He got turned, it was his head run in the turnbuckle and came up and was bleeding a gusher. It cut like a 20-something stitch cut. The Coliseum had just random kids that wanted to come in and help set up the ring and get in for free. That was back in those days, right? And the Coliseum would have, because they st- they stored the ring there, Uh, you know, and and set it up every Monday night. So they'd have their janitorial staff assisted by three or four kids that wanted to fucking get in carrying the ring posts around, set the ring up. Somebody put a razor blade, stuck it in the fucking duct tape that was used for the the padding on the turnbuckle because they didn't have turnbuckle pads in Memphis. They were real men and put some foam rubber in there and duct taped it. Somebody stuck a fucking razor blade in there, sharp side out, with just trying to fuck with somebody. And Roy Rogers was in the first match, and he was the first one who got his head in a turnbuckle. And there you go. But that was that was a sabotage rather than this was a complete accident. But anyway, if anybody knows the truth, let me know. Uh, any oh, so any basically they they beat Santana and Ortiz, but the end of the match fell apart. It wasn't the greatest FTR match ever because they were trying to do so much, and they probably had had their time cut down by that fiasco that took place on first, and were trying to do the same shit that they had talked about in less time. If I had to say, that would be my thought. Your your final comments? I thought it was all right, but it never got to any place where it was a great match or anything and we don't know what they were planning like i said the word is that wasn't the finish they were going to go another few minutes so knowing ftr 
it was probably a hot few minutes that we never got to see. Ortiz, you said he's in better shape, and he is, and I thought almost too good a shape. Because I never realized just how small he was. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying in a bad way, but height wise, you know, he wasn't a big guy. But now that he's lost weight, he looks really small. But, you know, he's in better shape, so that's good. But he's still, to me, the weak link of the tag team. Whenever there's a botch or a move that doesn't go right, it's always Ortiz in the middle of it. Yeah. But uh, I like Santana. I don't think Conan really brings much to the table here. There aren't a bunch of luchadors looking for a deal, so I don't know what he does. Well, I guess probably Cully, 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 Cully and Tonan, Cully and Tonan, Cully, God damn it, Conan and Tully, or Tully and Conan, were probably going to have something to do if they'd got there, but they didn't. So that was kind of a waste. Yeah, and I feel really bad. I hope Cash is okay. Uh, you know, a tag team that we've been dying to see more of, and we finally get to see them, and this happens in... I mean, they're from North Carolina. I don't know if they consider Charlotte their hometown, but in their home state. So it's really bad. Yeah. And I hope he, he does get better soon. And that, yeah. it, it just, it obviously for him to just walk off immediately like that, he had to look at it and go, okay, I'm fucking, I'm going to die. Oh, I saw, I went back and rewound it to the point where it happened to him after I saw him on the floor and I got just a little glimpse of the cut and I can't do that again. Like it was too, just yeah. seeing what it was and thinking about what it could be and how deep it could be. I couldn't do it. Again. All right. Anyway, continuing the injury report, uh, Tony Schiavone was with Dr. Britt Baker and Reba, who did a great promo. She's one of the, She may be the best promo in AEW. Uh, <laughs> tremendous. Now, by being such a heel, she's turned herself raving babyface. But now, because Reba's on a crutch and Britt Baker's in a cast, they're going to get somebody to watch their back. I can't wait to see who this might be. Uh, I... <laughs> They're going to fuck with the Britt Baker is suddenly now just over like crazy. And the, I bet you they're going to fuck this up some kind of way, putting some well, stooge with her or something. I agree with you in a sense that I hate the fact that everybody, if you're not in a faction or even if you are, you also have a giant entourage like Andrade. But if Britt Baker is going to have issues working for at a minimum the next few months because of a broken wrist or working a hard hitting match because of it. Does it make sense to have someone there for at least a temporary period of time? Like a, no, but, but a that's Mr. The thing. Hughes for her or something? But she didn't say, she said on Twitter or somebody retweeted it, she's not going to take any time off. And she wasn't saying I'm taking time off. She just, I'm going to have somebody watch our backs. So who, now another group. Um, Tony Schiavone announced the Chicago August 20th Rampage. And people started chanting CM Punk. We'll get there. There's somebody else that's going to refer to him in a minute. But uh, the Punk chants were started. And then Barb Brady goes to the back with Sting and Darby Allen. This was a 30-second interview, if that, where Sting just stood there mute. They're pay How much money are they paying him? And they And he can't be asked to say a line you've got sting on your program no. but he, he, don't you think maybe you get more value out of sting if he doesn't talk then don't show him at all did he just he's he's they're making him the way they got the most money out of sting was that fucking thing in wcw back in the 90s where they kept him in the in the rafters for a year he didn't speak and he didn't work and he came back and drew more money than he ever had then people started seeing him again and that bloom was off that rose. If he he doesn't need to just stand there next to Darby Allen, a foot shorter, a hundred pounds lighter, who mumbles, I'll be in Chicago, and then teases CM Punk doing the best in the world line. Sting didn't need to be standing there mute, or else why he could have said something about who's the best in the world, or what just don't stand him there like a schlub. Anyway. That's where I said CM Punk better be in Chicago at the United Center on August 20th or the fans will burn the building down. And I, we hear just as we've been recording this program, they've already sold out 10,000 seats. Well, not sold out, sold. Well, they've sold 10,100 seats of the 10,500 they set up for us, what they said, because everybody oh, and, oh, and their see. brother thinks that so it's going to be they think that cm punk is going to be there and cm punk better by god be there or as I, the prophecy i've made will come true many times what i've said 
Is so-and-so, if he's not on the card, will the people set the seats on fire? The answer here is yes. The people will literally set the seats on fire if CM Punk is not on that show that night. Oh. So do you think this shuts down the, 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 the questioning and it's a done deal? I don't think. Because they did this on TV three times on this show, because also MJF recited some of the words from the pipe bomb promo, I think it's pretty clear they have CM Punk. I think everyone knows it. There aren't any denials at this point. It's just a matter of when and where. And it appears it'll be in Chicago, which, of course, is a natural fit. Although yeah. I will say, you know, I said it before, the biggest thing they could do is Punk and Brian. Brian, when he was on the indies, was called the best in the world. Yeah. Punk in WWE made himself the best in the world. Yeah. I mean, technically, Darby could be teasing Brian, although we know he's not, but they're right there is the natural but, feud. But no, because here, if they've got both Chicago, out comes CM Punk, best in the world, New York, which would be more of a Brian Danielson town than possibly. New York, Brian Danielson comes out and tells CM Punk, you're not the best in the world, I am. Now we got some business. Let me ask you a question. Just like we talked about, we all assume CM Punk is signed and going to AEW. And hey, here's the thing. Wouldn't it be fucking hilarious if Tony Khan, the upstanding young man he is, and CM Punk, the upstanding young man he is, if they'd have shook hands and Tony just said, I'll get those contracts over to you, but we got to do this show tonight. And then Punk sees the reaction and calls Tony and says, before you send him papers, send over an extra seven fucking figures or else why is they're going to burn the United Center down, motherfucker? Well, I doubt CM Punk will be doing that, but my point was going to be, we all assume he signed or will be there. It's kind of a done deal to a lot of us in our minds. The buzz is out there. There have been articles about it. Tony Khan was interviewed. I recently read an article. He wouldn't comment on it, so it's coming up in interviews. Do you think it's smart? While everyone knows that, to even tease it on the air, or would it be a bigger deal not to tease it at all and just have him be there? No, because uh, you think you have to tease punk being there, even though there's so much buzz about it already out there. You think you need to do it on air, but that's where Vince McMahon would say, let's not kayfabe ourselves. Th then you get into the fucking, the Heyman uh, aspect of having to have a surprise on every show and constantly burning through surprises. Yes, we've done, I've done surprises before when it wasn't somebody that was going to instantly move shit. They are teasing but not confirming because the people are obviously taking this and running with it and believing it in their own minds, and they've teased it enough that it almost has to be true, or elsewise they'd look like complete buffoons, but they still haven't said it, but they know that the TV ratings and, and, and or the quick sellout, all the momentum, they can tell them they're going to see this without actually telling them they're going to see it, and they can lead the people to do that. And if they deliver, then it will work again. And if for whatever reason, the individual isn't at whatever place the people believe they're going to be, then they'll set the seats on fire. But this, if it was, if it was Christian cage, yeah, be a surprise. It's CM Punk in Chicago in a fucking NBA building. Let them know without telling them you're kayfabing yourself. Otherwise, plus the TV ratings. What do you think about the idea they're teasing Darby and CM Punk? Well, no, I think that was just a a way for Darby to say that that line or whatever and tease Punk on behalf of the on behalf of myself and the group. I don't think they're teasing Punk against Darby Allen. I don't know what they're teasing. They're both straight edge guys, and I'm thinking if CM Punk Punk would be a better fit for Darby Allen and Sting. Sting of 1980 something wouldn't have fucking been around Darby Allen for 15 seconds. Let's just say Punk is signed. And let's say because Punk knew he was going to sign and make a comeback, he's been watching AEW regularly. I could see there being a chance he watches Darby Allen and says, I want to work with that guy. I could also see CM Punk saying, you know what? A lot of people are really going to be happy I'm going to be back. I would love the challenge of making myself a heel. That's what I said last week, and you scoffed at me. I, I'm saying I could see him wanting that. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I can see him doing any goddamn thing he wants, too. And I'm telling you that Brian Danielson would be a raven baby face under any circumstances with that whole crowd. And CM Punk will be too, obviously, but he has the verbal ability 
to play with them psychologically and turn them and be the most hated motherfucker by telling them the truth that he's been to the big company and he ruled the roost there and he's better than all of them. And it's a fucking amateur hour, bunch of fucking Monty Python or shit in the way that CM Punk would do those things. And that he's better than everybody else. And people would fucking hate his ass because he could make them believe it because if he, everybody already knows he wasn't really a fan of the Bucks or Cody or whoever he was mad at, whatever. If he comes in and basically says, I'm taking this fucking guy's money and I don't give a fuck for any of the rest of these people because they're beneath me. And by the way, you fans, you're all a bunch of idiots because it's a clown show till I got here. Yeah, he could have snipers looking for him because you know how sensitive some of them might be in the locker room because you know how sensitive all these people's feelings are. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I think once CM Punk's in that locker room, it's going to be very interesting. And I have appreciated a lot of his comments and thoughts the last few years on Twitter. It's going to be very interesting to see how he coexists with various factions and people within AEW. And I think they ought to shoot with it. They ought to say CM Punk has demanded his own dressing room so he doesn't have to interact with the fucking hired hell. And then Chris Robinson can complain about it and there the Black you go. Rose removed from the tour. And and once and well, we'll talk about knocking the sponsors here in a few minutes. Anyway, real quickly, we got to get to that. Uh, the in, in New Japan Pro Wrestling U.S. title was on the line again. Lance Archer against Hikaleo, the son of Haku. And this kid's like six fucking ten. Um, I mean, this, this was a big man match where they were fighting and chopping meat and the kid's green and he's got a muffin top, but he's 6'10 and he's Samoan and he's like 20 years old. So he's going to be a fucking superstar. And he's got a nice way of carrying himself already. Nice little power slam, some facials, little body language. Um, this earned the Jim Ross bowling shoe, ugly reference, but that it was, but it furthers their new Japan relationship and got Archer a win. Although same thing here, Archer hit the superplex off the top rope, got a two count and then picked the guy up and hit his fucking move. Got the three count. Either one of those things coming just by themselves. The fucking guy looks better because he got caught by something. It can happen to anybody, but you get hit with something and then just picked up like a piece of dead meat and dropped again. You're getting beat flat. Uh, after the superplex, he just beat a body. Anyway, um, the next segment, I again, I like this guy, but I don't know what the fuck's going on here. Barb Brady was at Gorilla, the what they whatever they call, Gorilla Monsoon never worked for AEW, so whatever they call their Gorilla position. Tony Khan has his sign that says Tony. Jerry Lynn trainer, and then Cody was sitting under EVP. And Barb Brady asks Cody a question, and Cody stands up and speaks four words. And then suddenly from off camera, he is kicked square in the face by Malachi Black and knocked into Tony Khan's lap. He couldn't see the guy coming. He came from right in front of him. It was just because the camera had a close-up. You didn't say, do you see where I'm going with this? How the fuck do you not see this giant man barreling down on you when you're looking right at the booth that's coming to your face? You know, we talk about how dangerous it is backstage or in the parking lot of AEW. We never talk about the fact that multiple times it's been so dangerous to people who get attacked from in front of them while they're being interviewed. It's been multiple times where someone gets punched or kicked from right where the camera is, from right in front of where they're looking. And it happened here. So they fight then to the stage and into the arena, and the people were cheering. Did you notice this? Every time Malachi Black hit Cody, the people cheered, and every time Cody landed something, the people booed. I told was you. Was I hearing things? I told you a few months ago that when they return to fans, it's going to be interesting. There's a big contingent of AEW fans that see Cody as a heel. Uh, in real life or on camera, and even though he's wearing a white suit, and boy, it looks more and more like spy versus spy and each and every time. Say, and here's the guy who said, we don't want any of those old wrestling tropes like good guys and bad guys, heel and baby face. So he's wearing a white suit and the bad guy's wearing a black suit. But, and here's how, talk about a low IQ audience. That's why those phrases shouldn't be bandied around. 
the only one of this collection of clowns, Twinkle Toes and the Pie Face and Balding Buck and their whole crew, the only one that has legitimate pro wrestling talent is Cody, and he's the one they're booing because of his insufferable wife and his social climbing. And his booking and his and the way he's been used on the show. I mean, if you look at the executive vice presidents and the stars of the company from day one, Omega and the Bucks have been consistently on that show the whole time. Cody comes in, he disappears. He gets a program, he disappears. He starts up a feud, it doesn't make much sense. It happens, it goes away. There's no consistency. He's about to go film more of that big show for TBS. Or is it TBS or TNT? I don't even know. One TBS. of the Turner channels. He's it's about the to, Go Big Show. He's about to go film like more of that. So, I mean, that's going to take him away, too. He's never there. And when he does something there, even though he says that he's against boring old wrestling tropes, he's the one guy that uses them. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I can understand why AEW fans are Because he's the only one, that's, to this day, he's the only one. Every classic singles match that AEW has had has involved Cody, right? Every really good one. I don't know. I, I'm not going to sit here and make that judgment. I have to think about it, but I can understand. I mean, can you understand why those fans would see Cody who just pops in, gets this feud? And by the way, this other guy's fucking cool. Comes off WWE TV. Oh, I can, I can see why they would be cheering Malachi Black and, but, uh, and as as, Cody. But here's the thing. At least that's where these people are. So they think that the matches that Twinkle Toes and the Cucamonga kids have are better than the matches that Cody has because Cody has matches that make sense and they don't want that. That's why I say I bandy around the phrase low IQ viewers. If anybody has them, they are purposely picking the horse shit over the one guy that can actually perform out of that cluster of. Cause he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. With. He had a couple matches of Brody Lee. He had the match with Darby Allen the QT feud, give me a fucking break. The Shaq Jade Cargill feud. Oh, well, you which got Which is all me over there. the place. Cody has been used like shit for a long time. And it appears to a lot of fans, I think, that Cody doesn't have his heart in it like some of the other people do, whether you like him or not. And you know what? He's too inconsistent. Let's see Cody do six months straight every week on TV. Let's see that. I think if they'd have stopped at Cody versus Dustin when they had that match, I'd have thought, well, this is the greatest promotion in the world. But they they continued from there. You know, anyway. I, have a, I have a project for a listener out there. I was going to do it, but it would take some time, and I just don't have the patience. <laughs> if someone could go through every Cody promo from Dynamite, there aren't that many, really, when you think about it. And the percentage, of, or the ones that he's been interrupted, there's a lot of those. I wonder if there's a code if you took the words he actually got out of his mouth before he's attacked and put them all together. He got <laughs> nothing out here. He got three or four words out. I think that happened the last time. Two words and then someone comes out on the entranceway. What are all the words that Cody has actually said during these promos? What are words for <laughs> when no one listens anymore? Words for missing persons. And we've seen a few of those on this program. Anyway, up next, the trios match, which is the goofy lollipop guild way of saying it's a six-man tag team match. Mark Quinn, Isaiah Cassidy, and Angelico with Matt Hardy in the corner against Christian Cage, Jungle Boy, and Dino Douche with Dwarf Dong Sucker is back, by the way. And I got to be honest with you, I zoned out at the start because I didn't care. Uh, but I looked up and I saw Dino Douche, German Suplex, the three heels at once. He waist-locked one. That one grabbed his partner to hold on. That one grabbed his other partner to hold on. And it just so happened they were in waist-locks. And Dino Douche, German Suplexed all three of them, which, of course, they obviously leaped for themselves. And I said, fuck it, and fast-forwarded. So that was all of that. Did I miss anything? No. I mean, look, it's a Matt yeah. Hardy group match so no one cares and this is i mean i hate the way jungle boy's been used but although he hasn't done himself any favors with his promos and again the fans there still pop for him but boy sticking him in this feud with christian and matt hardy this is not good they've dragged him down 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 julia hart versus thunder rosa the blondes and julia hart look great together that's why we never see them, apparently. On 
they had a dark side of the ring episode that warmed the cockles of everybody's heart and featured Brian Pillman Jr. and left with an uplifting message about his potential career. And they give him one match on fucking television. And that's it. But yet, a lower-rated episode, the lowest-rated episode of all time of Dark Side of the Ring, features the bank-addicted drug robber, and they bring him in and give him a main event. Um, Brian Pillman Jr. and Griff Garrison, although I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Griff, they look good together, and they can work, and they'd be a nice babyface team that people could get behind. So we never see them on Dynamite. Instead, we see this hardy family ruckus and this fucking freak Angelico. At least Jack Evans wasn't belaboring us with his existence this week. Uh, but all this fucking outlaw talent that's friends with the executive vice presidents, instead of people that might actually, I don't know, look good and get over. So in this case, Julia Hart, she's green, but boy, she's got a wonderful smile. Thunder Rosa made it interesting. Julia Hart's a prospect, probably didn't need this much time on television. And I think somebody in the company should be embarrassed that the girls' match was at least technically better than the one that featured their supposed world champion. Uh, but Thunder Rosa hit a finish that may or may not have been what it was supposed to be because she looked surprised like Julia got in a position where she couldn't get her the way she wanted her and she modified it. And that's what I saw there. Thunder Rosa was super over, which was nice to see. Yeah. Super talented. Glad she signed with AEW because they actually have used her pretty well, all things considered. There were some rough spots in the match. I actually got some listeners writing to me saying they thought it turned into a shoot or they thought Thunder Rosa got what? mad at Julia Hart. I don't know. Again, I, I didn't see that. But several people surprisingly thought that Thunder Rosa was getting frustrated with Julia Hart during the match. but. Thunder Rose is over. And, you know, we talk about the roster stuff we've been doing. We should do one for a woman's roster. I said I wouldn't have a woman's roster if I had a promotion. What about a separate woman's promotion where you have a Serena Deeb and a Thunder Rosa and you can mix the them in with others? The Where's Serena gone, by the way? Uh, She's still there. Didn't they just announce her? Or am I wrong? They announced something for the NWA women's title. Is she still the NWA women's champion? I don't even no, know. No, that was Thunder Rosa, not Serena Deeb. No, then Serena Deeb won it, didn't she? Well, goddamn, I can't keep track, but the point is we haven't seen Serena in quite a while. So let's find out about that. Uh, one more thing before the main event. John Moxley on camera drinking out of a flask in the in in the fucking storage room somewhere. I wish I had a transcription of this. What is he even saying? It, you know, it was it was good. He meant it. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> exactly. But it was like an old Jimmy Valiant promo. It didn't make any sense if you wrote it down and listened to it. But the way that he said it, it sounded, you know, the guy can talk. It's just that nobody gives a shit about the rest of his whole presentation because he just has repetitive garbage matches and looks like shit. But he can talk. He can't go to Japan and he's mad at Tanahashi. But it was basically all about New Japan and their who's behind their green door or their forbidden door or whatever. I wish we still had Marilyn Chambers to look oh, up to. Give me a break. Look up to. Yeah. To look up to. You looked up to Marilyn Chambers. Look up to, down to, crossways, sideways, however you want to look at Marilyn Chambers. All right. And for the main event of the evening... AEW managed to blow something even better than Marilyn Chambers ever did because they managed to blow one of their sponsorships. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for the Garbage Wrestling Championship of the Universe, I guess, the pain maker Chris Jericho faced the bank-addicted drug robber on national television. And I had alternating emotions. I, was, I felt sad for Chris. I was embarrassed for the wrestling business. I even, at some points, felt bad for some of the people in their locker room, even though they brought this on themselves, AEW. Some of the guys back there had to be going, oh, come on. What the fuck? It's just, it's embarrassing. The guy that tried to get in the ring the other week on live TV looked like more of a threat to Jericho than this guy. 
here comes down the ramp. Well, first of all, Jericho comes out first in the Painmaker outfit. It reminded me, remember when Dusty teamed up with the Road Warriors and painted up and wore the spikes? <laughs> yes, yes. Dusty also teamed up with the Rock and Roll and fucking wore bandanas, but he was trying to, you know, sap some over. So Jericho looks like a Road Warrior in a cross between a Road Warrior and, a, and like I said, the chairman of the board of a German S&M club. And here comes... He was announced at 207 pounds. Can this guy be five foot six? He's got broken, missing, yellowed teeth, a meth head, basically uh, introduced from the murder, death, kill gang. So now we're promoting gang signs, gang symbols. And I, these are notes I wrote, and we'll come back to talk about this. I wrote TNT wants this on their station. Shouldn't some authority be investigating these people? The murder, death, kill gang that he rep that this clown represents. They're doing trash TV now for the lowest common denominator. Try to hot shot this thing because Tony Khan is not smart enough to realize he's got legitimate mainstream momentum with Brian Danielson and CM Punk. But just to make sure that poor Chris Jericho's midlife crisis doesn't enter a new phase, Tony Khan allows him to do this garbage match on television to prove that he can hang with the young kids in some respect, I guess. That, that's what Chris is thinking. They have, Tony Khan and Chris Jericho literally invited the guy that bites the live chicken's head off at the freak show to dinner at the White House. It embarrasses the business and makes the deathmatch scum more important believe they're really pro wrestlers. It's like when Trump got elected. All of a sudden, every sub-genre of subhuman, the conspiracy theorists, the right-wing militias, the racists, the fucking homophobes, the all-around stupid people that deny science and reality were validated because the president's one of us. So that's why they all came out of the fucking woodwork. Well, obviously, they're not going to lead a, an insurrection on the Capitol like those fucks did because this is still wrestling and not real life and political fucking drama. But this exhibition that they gave here validates every one of those garbage match wrestlers and every one of the garbage deathmatch fans that have been viewed as subhuman sewer dwellers all this time. And now are we're real wrestlers. See, one of us is on TV. And it just encourages them because Tony Khan's a mark. Jericho's having a midlife crisis and nobody can tell either one of these guys no. That's why this happened. And just to top it off, a no rules match with this supposed dangerous convicted felon maniac against the pain maker and the referee is 125 pound Aubrey, a girl. <sighs> MJF came out with popcorn to do commentary and I couldn't even listen to MJF because I was gobsmacked and dumbstruck at what they were allowing on their television. The, the murder, death, kill gang representative is pacing around in the ring with a pizza cutter and walking around like he's already shit his own pants with some kind of squat legged fucking stance while MJF is introducing himself. The, did you ever see Abdullah the Butcher walk over in the corner and wave his fork at the fans while somebody was going to color commentary or was he just fucking committing mayhem? Just mayhem. On the first move of the match. He waves the pizza cutter at Jericho and Jericho blades his arm. This I, was where immediately I started getting sad for Chris. A 50-year-old multimillionaire that used to be a star somehow has convinced himself that he needs to cut his arms with a razor blade to further a match with a fucking bank robber and a drug addict who does garbage shit in front of garbage people. And Chris has convinced himself this is somehow 
going to lead him to be remembered fondly by the wrestling public because he engages in garbage blood matches with scum. They went to the floor, they threw bad-looking punches, and they took weak rail bumps. And then Gage did some sloppy shit to Jericho. You can see the scars all over this clown's bald head from all this stupid shit he's done. He's a human scar. And then Jericho comes out from under this and gets the walls of Jericho, the Boston Crab, and the... The bank-addicted drug robber, I will call him Badder for short, reaches out and gets the ropes, and the referee calls for a rope break in a death match with no rules. But you got a break on the ropes. They're trying to have a wrestling match in the middle of this thing when they opened with a pizza cutter. So then they go to the floor, and Jericho grabs a headlock and has to throw four obviously fake headlock punches to Gage's head before Gage was able to hear, Post me! And then he did, so Jericho could now blade his head after he's already bladed his arm. So far, I've had wrestling school students that were in their first class that a pro could have had a better match with than Nick Gage. Then Gage brings out light tubes from under the ring, and the idiot low IQ AEW fans go crazy because a guy is bringing out fluorescent light tubes. But Jericho gets a baseball bat. And Jericho hits Gage with three fake baseball bat shots. I'm not saying it was a fake bat. I'm saying the shots were fake. because I, They didn't look good, but I know they were fake because Gage got right up and stopped Jericho, and Jericho dropped his bat. And then Gage ignores the bat laying there so that he can pick up his pizza cutter. Brian, if you're in a fight with a guy, you got your choice. The bat or the pizza cutter? Which 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 is your pick? It depends if I'm anywhere near fresh pizza. Well, we'll talk about that later on, fresh pizza. It's going to be No, we won't. It's going to be very scarce around the AEW locker room. I wouldn't call but it anyway, fresh either, but anyway. Yeah. So Chris Jericho, as I mentioned, a wealthy 50-year-old, formerly respected professional wrestler is allowing a fucking scum-sucking, bottom-feeding, bank-robbing, meth-cooking circus geek to slice his head up with a pizza cutter on TNT cable nationally across the world. And that's the break spot. And as that pizza cutter is slicing Jericho and blood's flying everywhere... They go to the break and the spots for Domino's Pizza. And the first thing you see is this pizza cutter cutting this <laughs> delicious, steaming piece of pizza, this pie pizza pie. We'll get back to that. They come back <laughs> on the other side of the break. By the time they're back, there's four chairs, a baseball bat, fluorescent light tubes, and a pizza cutter, and a pane of glass in the ring, which. The bank-addicted drug robber, Batter, sets the pane of glass across the chairs that he's set up. Jericho is helpless in selling. There's multiple weapons within Batter's reach. And old Charlie Manson Jr. here is stacking shit on top of shit to throw his opponent through it. So the bank-addicted drug, ro drug robber puts Jericho under the pane of glass so that then he can jump off the ropes onto the glass and then, of course, moving on through to Jericho. Of course, why wouldn't you do that? But Jericho gets up and blocks it, gets up on the turnbuckles and hits 10 fake punches to Nick Gage's head. And I know it's hard to punch bald guys, but it can be done if you're not blown up and disgusted, which is obviously what Jericho was at this point. And he gave a Hurricane Rana to bank-addicted drug robber through the pane of glass, sending glass flying into the crowd everywhere. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. And after this bump, where a guy got Hurricane Rana'd off the top rope and took a forward flip through a pane, pane of glass, shattering into a million pieces, you see the TV, the camera shot of the crowd in the front row and they're smiling and laughing. And that tells the whole story. Oh, by the way, that was a two count. 
Hurricane Ron off the top threw a pane of glass and chairs to the floor. That's a two count. The people were laughing at this. That's what they came for, to laugh at the freaks in the freak show. I'm sad for Chris that he feels that this is something that he has to do for some reason. But nevertheless, then Jericho takes a bump in the glass. And the, the sideshow geek breaks multiple light tubes over his head and gives Jericho a pile driver in the glass for a two count. And this is where I was insulted that they were doing this in a formerly great wrestling town in my adopted hometown where I lived for longer than I lived for anywhere except Louisville, Kentucky in my life. And thinking of what all the great talent that had appeared there before would think of this. It was both disgusting and moving at a snail's pace at the same time. So then Badder stabbed Jericho in the head with a broken light tube multiple times. Remember, it's printed in the Midnight Express book that TBS, the Turner Broadcasting System, sent WCW a memo in 1989, madder than fucking hornets, about us putting a plastic bag over Ric Flair's head. Don't ever do this again. Clash of the Champions. Yep. Now, Meth Head McGee pulls out taped light tubes that are taped together, and JR finally has had enough. And he says, well, this is fun. <laughs> and Tony Schiavone not picking up on that JR would rather be having another goddamn intestinal operation like he had years ago than be sitting in front of this exhibition. Tony didn't pick up on that. Tony said, this is the place to be, is it not? And there was dead silence. JR didn't say a fucking word and excrement knew probably from the look on JR's face not to jump in. Tony was pretty unbearable throughout this episode, but specifically here, he's just becoming overly effusive about everything and he laughs through I'm everything. I'm telling you, and- he's got the biggest paying job he's had in 20 years. He didn't watch wrestling for 20 years. He doesn't give a fuck anymore. He's thrilled to be there and he just laughs at the whole thing because what the fuck has happened to the wrestling business? He don't know. And it's not his job to find out. And so he's the perfect one for this, but JR is realizing that this is getting, the smell of this is getting all over him. He, Jericho's doing it willingly. JR signed to be an announcer of a wrestling show, and now this is what he's going to have to put up with. Jericho's doing it to be cool for whatever reason. So then finally, Jericho hit. Bank addicted drug ro- robber with the light tubes and hit him with the Judas elbow and one, two, three. And that was it. Bloody garbage mess, sad, embarrassing, insulting, bewildering on so many levels. I don't know what to think. And then the only way they could top that was with the lead to next, next week. So his first labor, Jericho's was, according to MJF, was You got to fight Sean Spears and Sean Spears can use a chair and you can't. The second week, he's got to engage in a bloodbath full of weapons with a goddamn legitimate brain damaged goof off the street where anybody could be hurt at any minute. Next week, he's got to hit a move off the top rope to win the match. Oh, and by the way, your opponent is Juventud Guerrera who you knocked in a promo last year is somebody that's organizing this program, a fucking nineties WCW mark, or has Juventud Guerrera been famous for the last 15 or 20 years? And I missed it. Well, they even said he hasn't been on TNT in 15 years. It's actually 20 years. He hasn't done too much in the States since that time. And how old is he now? He's got to be at least my age, 41, maybe up to 45. No, there. no, wait, think about this. Juventud Guerrero was on WCW television in 1998. That's 23 years ago. What was he, 17, 18 then, or was he in his 20s? He's 46. Okay, the fucking top rope aerial artist that Jericho has to hit a move off the top rope to win against is four years younger than Jericho. And... Aren't you following a shooting with a stabbing or maybe even actually a murder with a pickpocketing <laughs> to yeah. go from a death match with a bank addicted drug robber to, oh, you got to wrestle a 
middle-aged luchador and win with a move off the top rope. Give me your thoughts on this exhibition of a match before we talk about the rest of the story with what happened the next day that nobody could have ever foreseen coming. Probably not a shock to you. I didn't think very much of this. I had never watched a Nick Gage match, but I had seen clips just recently. Made, I saw the two of us. I We're saw the Matt people. Cardona clips uh, from what was it last weekend or something, and it hit me watching this. This guy isn't good. I mean, any of the things that you'd be able to do in a wrestling ring beyond deathmatch wrestling, it doesn't seem like those are his skills. So then it comes down to just the deathmatch stuff, and it. It hit me that this is like Joey Ryan and the dick spot. Jericho doing this is exactly the same thing, where everyone, for a while, that became the thing you had to do it. You had to participate. You had to do it. When I watch Nick Gage standing there, and it's so stupid, holding up the pizza cutter, holding up the light tube, and then doing it the same way that I just watched him do it to Matt Cardone in that video, I realized this isn't very special. This doesn't look very good. This guy isn't very good at it, at least in my eyes. I'm no deathmatch aficionado. But it's like the dick spot. And this is the thing of the moment where Nick Gage has got a moment here and people will pay attention to him and indulge him like this. But I think they may be embarrassed they were ever a part of it. Who knows? You know, also, that's a poisonous gas that's emitted in addition to the glass flying everywhere. That's a poisonous gas that's emitted when you break those tubes, which is why they're only supposed to be disposed of in certain ways. So maybe... Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Maybe somebody caught some kind of issue from that. Who knows? But AEW <laughs> caught an issue. Let's go ahead and, and recap what happened the next day. I don't know who could have foreseen this, Brian. I don't know who could have called something like this happening. Do you have your the rooster crowing still? Wait a minute. I'll just do it. Because once again, you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be a brain surgeon. You just have to have common sense to know what I've been saying about deathmatch wrestling and about a lot of this garbage for the past 10, 15, 20 years, however long. I haven't changed my tune, and it's the same thing, and here's an illustration. Nobody wants to sponsor this shit. It doesn't fly on television. It turns people off in the mainstream. The only people that tolerate this kind of shit are the people, as they say, in the wrestling bubble. But these people are in an even smaller bubble than the wrestling bubble. I talked about how that the the EVPs are convinced that their shit don't stink because these acolytes fawn over everything they do. So therefore, they think they're over with everybody in the world when the majority of people in the world don't know that these other people exist in the fucking world. But now they're messing with the real world because it may not be a big thing. Oh, yeah, we're going to do the pizza cutter spot and then the light tube spot because they live in this outlaw mud show wrestling bubble that's even smaller than the real wrestling bubble. And it's no longer a shocking thing or something to cause anybody to take pause or to wait a minute. What are we talking about here? When they say, yeah, I'll break the light tubes over you. And then the pane of glass and it will do this because they think that this type of shit is acceptable in the normal world to normal, sane people like you and me, Brian, that used to watch wrestling, not fucking torture porn. So what happened the next day? I wasn't there in the chairman of Domino's office, but whoever runs Domino's, he's old Charlie Domino, the boss, right? Next morning, he apparently saw, well, Domino's is trending on Twitter last. What happened? And somebody in their office apparently had to tell old Charlie Domino, the head of this whole thing, well, yeah, actually, what happened last night? You know, we bought those spots on TNT, Turner Network Television, National Cable. And right before our spot of our delicious pizza being cut by our sharp pizza cutter played, a convicted felon who's admitted to being addicted to drugs on several occasions and robbed a bank was slicing up another professional wrestler 
on TNT television with a pizza cutter. They were bleeding from their arms and their heads and breaking glass instruments over themselves. But the big thing was he was eating this guy's head up with a pizza cutter right before our fucking commercial. And then old Charlie Domino, like anybody with any fucking sense would, said, this was on TNT? This wasn't on some kind of goddamn X-rated porn channel or some fucking local station, but this was on TNT? They do that type of thing on television these days? Cut that fucking buy out. What have I been saying, Brian, for years? You fucking run the risk of doing this garbage for little to no return of pissing off your TV station or your sponsors or both. Roy Shire ran the most successful wrestling territory in the history of Northern California until he pissed too many people off at TV stations because he spit on their floor and cussed their fucking employees out. Then he didn't have no TV and then he didn't have no territory. The Sheik was one of the richest promoters in wrestling, but he did that hardcore bullshit too long and turned too many people off, and he also, as I've told the story, couldn't get TV in Cincinnati because the biggest station in town kept a tape of the Sheik using a snake and a blade on this other guy's head and said, that's why wrestling will never be on my television program or on my television station. Whether it's somebody saying the wrong thing in Calgary and Ed Whalen getting upset or the sponsor that got turned off or the fucking guy that owned the TV station and said, wait a minute, what's this doing on my, in my fucking schedule? Whatever. And now Domino's Pizza, because it was all over the internet and they were, obviously their reaction was all over the internet. Now they're going to be going to TNT and say, what the, you're putting our spots and we spend a lot of money on this fucking show where these guys are wallowing around in broken glass, bleeding from asshole to appetite, and they're using a pizza cutter to slice each other up with right before our commercial. What the fuck's wrong with you people? Which then, even if there aren't the same people that hated wrestling and force WCW out of business 20 years ago by having it sold at fire sale prices because they didn't want it on their fucking station. They might not be there, but there might be some new people that have that same idea that are just waiting for the opportunity to go, look at this fucking horse shit. Are we, what's next? Are we going to actually telecast the freak show from the county fair and show the bearded lady and the world's fattest man and the two-legged fucking fetus and the goddamn four-legged fetus in the fucking glass jar? Is this, we're, we're appealing to the lowest common denominator of viewer? It might not be this time, but if they keep doing this horse shit, if they don't train their guys better and tell them stop doing all these dives, somebody's eventually going to break their neck and die on live TV. That wouldn't do any good. Or they're going to do more of these garbage matches and slice each other up and pour salt in the wounds and lemon juice and weed whackers. And maybe Black and Decker will be the next ones to get mad and pull their sponsorship. But sooner or later, if they can't grow up and act like grown adults, the big boys, where the big boys play, instead of these outlaw mud show mindsets that they've all got because that's all they've ever had experience with because they've never been involved in a major promotion in a major company in a major way with sponsors and a network and mainstream recognition they can't behave themselves so that's what they're getting if only somebody could have predicted something like this happening and i'm sure it will happen again in the future if only somebody could have predicted that too If only there could be somebody out there that knew just don't do stupid shit on your television when you don't need to. When you've got momentum with two of the biggest stars that you could possibly attain coming in, what if by the time they get there, they don't have a television program? Because TNT says, what the fuck are you people doing? This is low even for us. And we know the bar has been lowered. Not only for television viewership, but just television content in general. 
the bar is definitely lower than it was 20 years ago. But even for us at this point in time, you people are unsuitable. Fuck for nothing. Their rating would have been the same because they've hot shot at everything and they had everything on this program like they had everything on last week. Now they're going to try to have everything on next week. Sooner or later, what do they follow this with? Is this the Daffy Duck routine where he follows Bugs Bunny's vaudeville act by drinking nitroglycerin and blowing up? And then as his spirit is ascending to heaven, Bugs looks up and says, you got me there, Daffy. I can't top that. And Daffy looks down and says, yeah, but what do I do for an encore? What are they going to do next week that follows this? And then when they get Daniel Bryan, they're going to follow him with CM Punk or vice versa. And by October, they're going to burn all that shit out. So the point I'm making is all they did was get in their own way. They made trouble for themselves by catering to the lowest common denominator of subhuman idiot that wants to see this kind of shit. And it's obviously fake to begin with. They're cooperating with each other, which makes it even worse. That's my problem has always been with garbage wrestling. I don't mind a good street fight amongst talented guys that can bleed and hit each other with shit and make it look like a fight. But this is just a, a literal freak show in that you see two guys obviously working together with each other to really mutilate each other. That's what these garbage matches are. It's what they've always been. So they got CM Punk coming. They got Daniel Bryan coming. They got the momentum. They got two one million viewerships two weeks in a row. And because of that, they stick this in and take a chance on screwing the whole thing up. Fuck. And it's not like you couldn't see this coming. Oh, I said it on the again. show. I said it to you as a joke. I said, hey, wouldn't it be funny if AEW got a pizza sponsor yes. for that match? And you said, no, they would never, ever do that. <laughs> you, you shot but down see, my here, joke. But see, here's the thing. We don't know whether that domino spot, whether they bought, specifically bought AEW wrestling or whether they just bought TNT. Because They're all over TNT, I will say. Okay. It, it maybe well, both, yeah. But see, here's the thing. If you're not familiar with buying television out there, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy specific programs, obviously, if you want, that appeals to your product. The, the, the audience watching that show appeals to your product appeals to them, I should say. But you also buy a station. And like on local television, it's an ROS spot, run of station. That means that you're going to spend $1,000 and you're going to get however many ROS spots, but they're going to pop up basically in unfilled commercial spots in various programs in various day parts, not specific programming. ROS spots, you can get more of them at less price each. And just if you've got a, a product that if you're just a food store, well, everybody eats food. So get an ROS spot. They'll pop up everywhere. The six o'clock news, two o'clock in the morning, whatever's not sold, you'll get. But if you've got a, a product or service that specifically appeals to viewers of certain programs, you spend a little more money per spot to buy those. So the question is, did they buy, T, uh, did they buy TNT all over the place? Or did they buy AEW in person, personally, specifically? Specifically, yeah. If they bought AEW specifically, they'll never do it again. And if they bought TNT generally and ended up being placed there by some algorithm on the computer, then they're going to be screaming at TNT, what are you doing? And they're going to keep a closer eye on it and the the – Ad reps, the fucking people in the marketing department are then going to be told, watch this program, see what's in it. Are we going to get any more complaints? Let's try to catch problems before they come up. Now they're looking more closely at the program. Now they may be reticent to put certain spots in that show. It can't help the um, a show they're paying for, by the way a show that they pay 
AEW for. So they're getting headaches from people that pay them over something that they're paying for. Can you tell me in what business that's a good idea, no matter what kind of genre you're in? I can't. Okay. So that's simple. Cornette's right again, because it's not hard to figure out. Don't do stupid shit. Closing thoughts on this program. It would have been funny if AEW disavowed Domino's Pizza for their shitty pizza. Well, I, now there you got something there. It's the same thing. Domino's is the McDonald's of burgers. They sell more. They don't taste better, but they sell more. McDonald's they got a pizza. lot of money. What now? McDonald's of pizza. The McDonald's of pizza. Well, yes, that's exactly what I sent out by mental telepathy. <laughs> that's right. And you just, you heard it. But yeah, the, the, I'm not saying it's the greatest pizza. And of course, you have some questionable taste in pizza, but we won't even go into I that. I know now. my pizza. Mr. No Meat. I know my pizza, and you know that's true. Nevertheless, we're not talking about the quality of Domino's pizza. We're talking about the amount of money they spend on advertising, which is massive, and the pull that they probably have with the fine folks at Turner Network Television. And there's going to be some conversations about this for the various reasons that I just mentioned. And it's not because I'm a goddamn know-it-all smarty pants that I'm saying this. It's because I've been dealing with TV stations for 30 fucking years. And this is the kind of shit that happens. Well, Mr. Know-it-all smarty pants, a few things before we wrap up. One is I have an idea of how AEW can get out of this to their benefit. How? All of a sudden on Dynamite, I think they're back in Jacksonville next week, right? All of a sudden, a car pulls up during Dynamite. It's not a car. It's an ambulance. Out of the back, oh my God, Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> What's he doing here? Why does he have Papa John's pizza with him? He's delivering a Papa John's pizza. He's delivering Papa John's to announce that they will be the new sponsor of AEW. Fuck you, Domino's. Shaq's in the house. But anyway. I have to bring this up before we wrap up because several people while we've been recording have been sending it to me. I have not read The Observer yet, but Dave's review of Jericho and Gage, briefly, I'm not going to read the whole thing. This match well, was... how long could it be? Well, here's what the important part is. This match was insane. I hated it personally, but it absolutely worked to the live crowd oh. and you really have to go four stars or even more what? Because it both worked for the audience as far as execution and building, excuse me, as far as the execution and building, it was great. And building, it was, yeah, that's what he wrote. So four stars, possibly more, although he hated it, but because people in the room liked it, it got the four stars. But wait a minute, like we mentioned earlier in the program, Ultimate Warrior versus anybody never got the four stars, even though those people were just jumping up and down and fucking masturbating furiously. There are nonstop examples, not including the Ultimate Warrior 2, but this is the new standard for at least Chris Jericho matches, but overall... For a, for a, a badly worked, phony-looking garbage match between a 50-year-old man and a bank-addicted drug robber meth head that's got to be in his 30s and looks 20 years older, that gets the same rating as Flair and Steamboat. And those are my closing thoughts. We'll see everyone on the drive through SmackDown, Woo! questions, songs, who knows what else. There you go. Well, it's been a four-star episode, folks, and we're done. Thank you. Fuck you. Don't rob a bank. And bye-bye, everybody.